I was involved in Freemasonry, not necessarily by, because I, I went for it. I was teaching an entire police department to be remote viewers, and they happened to all be Freemasons. And so I got involved in it that way. But then I started studying it and what it was about. And <clears throat> the important thing to know about Freemasonry is it's 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 not all the... It's not all the bullshit that everybody tries to make it out to be like this, you know, nefarious uh, process. It's not. Freemasonry actually came into existence because it's a school. It's a school designed to teach you how to be a man. I mean, women have this really clear biological line, right? From when they become, they stop being girls and they become a woman. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that doesn't happen for us. You know, it's. Nobody sets us down and teaches us how to live rightly, act rightly as a man, what our responsibilities are towards ourselves, those around us, towards our, our creator, whatever you as ascribe that to be for you. Uh, and Freemasonry is precisely that. It, is, it has two different tracks that you can take, <clears throat> but it is, it is a school of manhood. It is to teach you how to live a life reviewed, you know, how to live a life that is looked at by yourself and by others and uh, analyzed and evaluated. And, you know, so you can not just set off on an azimuth and be whatever you choose to be, but that you can set off on an azimuth and constantly make azimuth corrections through your life to, to be better, to be better, to be better, right? Mm. And uh, the idea is to leave this life knowing that your life was an examined life that you lived, uh, a fruitful, you know, uh, capable, powerful life. And the idea is to be remembered and your death regretted kind of thing. You know, it's that kind of an idea. Where did it come from? <clears throat> well, it, it started in the 16th century, like in, in, in England. Yeah. Uh, and you know the whole story of you know the Knights Templars evolved out of it, which they did. And uh, but that's you know that's where it was started, and that's what it was. the The Illuminati is an entirely different uh, operation, and that had its own genesis, you know, in origins, which primarily came just out of the fact that in that time frame, and the uh, 1700s you had i mean everything was basically owned by the church right mm -hmm. uh the catholic church so land was owned by the catholic church they decided what books you could read what books you couldn't read if you could read at all uh they they it, they controlled everything and it was very autocratic and there was a kid whose father was actually uh one of the readers for the church uh, and the university was at in Germany, and this father, you know, once when the child, when the kid came in as a teenager, he had a stack of books next to his desk and said, uh, you need to look at these, you need to read these. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But they were not going to go into the library. They couldn't go into the library because the church wouldn't allow it. The order would not allow it. Right. But he wanted his son to become familiar with these things. And so he, he did read it, and I'm shortening, shortening this considerably, but mm -hmm. really where, what the Illuminati became <clears throat> was this bastardized version of masonry, Freemasonry. Uh, this German along, you know, started recruiting guys out of Freemasonry, and they started writing their own charters for each of their degrees and everything. It was really a competition with Freemasonry. The Illuminati, Freemasonry, you know, and they were... They were just trying to bring, they were trying to recruit people from Freemasonry over into the Illuminati. And they made their stuff there, like their initiations and their ceremonies and that stuff a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, drastic. I mean, not like sacrifice and things like that, but they made it more macabre mm. in order to get them over to, to try to set themselves apart from Freemasonry is what they were doing. 
And they were trying to, why would you want to do that? Because if you have a club that has the most powerful men in the region in it, and you're starting a new club, so to speak, you want the most powerful men in the region, bringing the dollars, the it, right? right? Bringing right. the money, bringing, yeah. because they're all paying, they're paying dues to be belong to the Illuminati. And when you read the documents, the original founding documents of the Illuminati, it's almost, it's, it's almost uh, laughable. And, and it's so obvious what they were doing. And it really only survived for a few years. It, it didn't last for very long. And ultimately, because the Pope and the King of, uh, uh, of Germany shut that crap down. They were like, no, 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 we're not having this. And they shut it down. And Freemasons also uh, had to get really quiet at that time. But the Illuminati is this kind of upstart men's club at that point, weird, which only attracted certain people, but it attracted some of the really powerful people out of it. And why would they come over? Well, not because it was more spiritually enlightening. They came over because it was a new club. And, you know, it was like, even today, if you came over as a marketing person and brought a bunch of people with you, you're going to get compensated for who you're bringing over. And the guy, you know, that, founded the Illuminati and penned all of the charter and everything we were going to do. That's what he was doing. Hey, come with me, bring these guys with you and I'll make sure you get this percentage of their dues to belong to our club. And the more we get, the more you'll make. And that's how it started in the Illuminati wow. until, until the, uh, the leadership in Germany and the leadership of the church turned around and, you know, just said no more. And, you know, started imprisoning, you know, torturing, executing others. And the man that formed the Illuminati actually is still buried in Germany. He's, he's buried, he has really? a simple grave marker in between six trees that are planted in a circle. What was his name? Oh, I, I'd have to look it up for you. I mean, I'm, I'm too old to remember shit like that, you know? I always quickly. thought that the Illuminati was was made up by the media. I, I, I don't remember where I saw it. I think I saw it in an um, Adam Curtis documentary. But I do know the first time it was written about in the U.S. was around the JFK assassination. People started writing articles about it, for, you know, I don't know what the purpose was. Maybe it was like purposeful to conspiracy or conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, conspiracy. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at, here it is. <clears throat> This is my lecture on this. And so this is the guy that found it. Adam, Adam Weiss. Weishaupt. Interesting. Yeah. So you were teaching remote viewing to a police department? I've taught it to several police departments, yeah. Currently? You still do that? No, no. Why were police departments reaching out to you <clears throat> to learn about remote viewing? Well, you know, back when... Uh, the book, which I hate the title of Psychic Warrior, first came out, it, it it drew a lot of attention because it was the first time that anybody had connected the dots to the military intelligence uh, community and then this very bizarre controversial intelligence collection methodology called remote viewing, which... That's the first time those words were, the phrase was ever used, remote viewing. Those were coined by Ingo Swan. And people continue to bastardize it to this day, which just drives me crazy. I mean, somebody just sent me, a friend of mine, former VP of Sony Music, uh, just sent me a picture of a bar in Manhattan, and it's called Remote, remote View Cocktails. Uh, we see a cocktail in your future mm -mm. And, yeah i'm not kidding you and it's uh it was yeah so that's amazing yeah what do you do with that uh it it is it has become like this umbrella term now that encapsulates anything that anybody wants it to i mean there are like 72 different variants of human ability from you know clairvoyance to esp whatever you want to call it clairsentience clairaudience clairvoyance clair you know mm -hmm. and it goes on down and 
remote viewing is just one of those things. Remote viewing is not at the top of the list as an umbrella. Remote viewing is a, is a dogma, a, a protocol. It's a, a learned process. And I, I often get into just disputes with people that show up on you know, various forums like uh, on Clubhouse or something else. You know, we'll come in and go, well, I'm a, I'm a practicing shaman and I'm a remote viewer. No, you're not. Yeah. Have you been trained in remote viewing? No. Uh, then you're not a remote viewer. Uh, you're just a practicing shaman. I mean, how would you feel if I just one day stood up and said, I'm a shaman? I mean, maybe this particular character would go, well, that's cool, you know, whatever you want to be. But the truth of the matter is there are certain practices and priorities and processes of learning. There are gates and, you know, there are things that you have to do before you can turn around and accept that mantle and throw it out and say, this is what I am. Mm -hmm. You don't get to just do it because somebody once wrote a book. Right. And that book then tied this whole idea to a military intelligence collection methodology. And so now in order to, in my opinion, kind of ride on that and to try to, you know, to be part of that wave, that upsweep back then was to turn around and, and start calling yourself a remote viewer no matter what you did. I mean, no matter what you did, a palm reader, oh, I'm a remote viewer. There's a guy out there now <clears throat> who's a SEAL, a Navy SEAL, uh, who does a podcast, not, not Jocko. Okay. He's a legitimate guy. This other guy is Jocko's uh, not legit. No, Jocko is legit. Oh, oh I thought no, you were saying he, he wasn't legit. No, he's a legit oh. guy. Now this guy is, is legit. He's okay. a seal. Okay. And, uh, I know guys that know him because seals work for me, but, uh, he, he has written a book called, you know, combat intuition and, talks about intuition but he he doesn't just phrase it as spidey sense or you know as intuition he's actually applied remote viewing to it so some of my students because i encourage my students to go you know stick their beak into anything that's out there and and to participate if if they want to and so they were there listening to this guy talk and they raised the hand and go where you're talking about remote viewing. I mean, were you part of the remote viewing unit? No, 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 I wasn't that. Well, where did you, where did you learn remote viewing? Uh I I kind of just picked it up as I went along. Like, well, what do you mean picked it up as you went along? I mean, did you take a class from anybody or read a book about it or something else or are you just you just assigning that title to yourself? Mm. And he knew he was cornered. There are two women and sitting in front of him. He goes, "Well, I, I just, I just, I just picked it up, and I, I you know, I think I watched a couple videos on TikTok." Yeah, no kidding. So it was something like that, and of course they were like, "Yeah, okay, there we go." So uh, I think when you do stuff like that, it's certainly not, uh, it's not up there with stolen valor, but it certainly is. It's just something you shouldn't do. If you're not, if you've not been formally trained in the protocol, then stop telling everybody that you know how to do it because you don't. So I always thought, when, whenever I have thought of remote viewing, up until maybe a couple months ago, I always thought like, okay, yeah, you read palms too. Come on, what else? What else? Maybe that's the CIA doing their job. Maybe that's the media doing their job. But that's kind of like how I've always been conditioned. I've watched videos of people talking about remote <clears throat> viewing, and my in in intuitive sense was just like this okay stop like this is bullshit yeah um and rightly I, so and yeah. I, I really started digging into your background and listening to your podcast with sean hazlett amazing podcast by the way um and, and your book it's it seems like something that actually was utilized by our government and other governments right absolutely yeah. now but so here's my question is it something that's actually measurable and testable mm. yeah absolutely um look it started off at stanford research institute international in uh 72 the director of the central intelligence agency found out that the chinese and the russians were working in various areas of clairvoyance 
uh, psychic ability. And the concern was the same kind of concern that drove, you know, the MK Ultra project, the mind control. Uh, I mean, as nefarious as that was under Gottlieb, you have to understand that these are individuals that see themselves as responsible for protecting the Republic. And if we have to, you know, if we have to cut a swath through a few of the citizens of the Republic in order to protect the entire Republic, okay. I don't personally ascribe to that, but we have to understand that's what these guys did. And they probably assumed that other nations were doing the same thing. They, so they wanted to be up to speed. Their intel was precisely that. Right. And so their fear was that they're going to they're going to learn how to control human minds and we're not we're not even dabbling and we don't even know what to do. So there becomes this race, you know, to develop that capability and there's collateral damage in doing something like that. It, it is there, and I'm not justifying it. I'm just explaining it, that it's there, yeah. horrifying as it may be. I mean, they, they know uh, that there must be, there are at least tens of thousands of individuals that were you know, unwittingly exposed to and participating in this kind of development and uh, investigation and experimentation. Mm. But they were doing it because these guys actually thought that if they didn't do this, uh, they were going to be behind the power curve to from the Chinese and the Soviet Union at that time and anybody else that we believe to be an enemy of, of our nation. Again, a horrible thing and a, a costly thing to a lot of people, uh, but that's that's why they were doing it. So in in 72 the 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 intel comes in that says the chinese are sequestering they're going out and and finding uh youth from various villages throughout china who have a reported you know clairvoyant capability esp whatever and they're bringing them all in and they're you know they're corralling them and they're training them and working to enhance them and going to use them as an intel collection capability. And it, it's around about this time, you know, that the director of the Central Intelligence Agency says, well, are we doing it? And of course, we weren't. And the response was, well, then we need to be doing it. If they're doing it, we need to be doing it. We need to find out there's something to this. So they put out a... Uh, a request for proposals uh, to various research agencies. And the one that ends up getting the contract is Stanford Research Institute International. Russell Targ, Harold Putoff, and about 18 other physicists, mathematicians, scientists, etc., and a whole truckload of you know natural gifted psychics and other people like Ingo Swan, Yuri Geller, you know, Pat I just, Price. I just learned all about Yuri Geller a couple of weeks ago. Is that right? Well, <laughs> did you learn that he was a paratrooper? No, I didn't. He was a paratrooper in the uh, in the Seven Day War. Yeah, he was a paratrooper. Oh, really? He was actually wounded. Yeah, he jumped and was combat wounded. No way. Yeah, no. I learned uh, when I when I had that interview with the with the guy Jack up in San Francisco, the one that you saw. Oh yeah, he was teaching me all about Uri Geller. I didn't yeah. know. He said he was a Mossad guy. <laughs> Maybe he got that wrong. I don't know if he was Mossad. He was a paratrooper. Okay. That I know. Okay. But, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time with Yuri back. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Back in the day, I did, like in the 90s. I've been with his family, his wife, his uh, son and daughter, and yeah, I've been to his house many times. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I'm sure it, it's, I think he's sold that house now. I don't know. But I mean, I used to do long walks along the Thames with him and... It was a uh, Soning on Thames is where the house was. And uh, I understood, I, I really did understand Uri. He was uh, a very capable, smart, bright, articulate young man, but he was also a businessman, you know, and an entertainer. Right. That was, he had made that decision that that's what he's going to do. So can I tell you, you know, where the real abilities started and stopped and then the entertainment you know took play took over i can't right i mean i've watched him bend spoons right in front of my face and i mean i'm i can't bend a spoon <laughs> 
just so we're clear on that. Right. I cannot bend a spoon uh, or a knife or a fork unless I'm like really, you know, just trying to cut a hard something, right? Mm. I have no idea how to do that and I cannot focus my mind to do it. I understand I understand the the mechanism as it is articulated, but I can't for my for the life of me get myself to be capable of doing that. But you know, so when he's doing that, I'm watching very carefully. I mean, the first time he ever did it, we were on the Danny Bonaducci radio show. <laughs> In, uh, in Portland, uh, Oregon in 1996. Both of us were there on Danny's show. That was funny as hell. And, uh, and it, you know, Yuri came outside and, uh, and, and pulled out a spoon. And I, what was odd, I noticed, was he standing literally 18 inches from me, right? He pulls the spoon out of his pocket but he puts his left foot against this Xerox machine, this copy machine that was right there for this radio station. He put his foot against that. And I mean, maybe I kind of glanced at that, but he certainly didn't have a sleight of hand where he changed spoons or anything like that. And he then just started rubbing the spoon and bent it and in, right in front of me. I mean, I, I looked directly at it, he bent it and he signed it and gave it to me. And I still have that spoon to this day. And that was a long time ago. And every other time that I saw him do it, like going to dinner with him and his family, people would come by, recognize him, and he would stand up and, and do the same thing. He would bend the cutlery for him right there wow. at the dinner table. Like somebody else's cutlery? Oh, yeah. Or would it also at the restaurant? It wouldn't just be his that no, he brought? No, no. Wow. I knew, I knew you were going to ask that. That's why I tell that next piece of the story. No, he would just stand up and take a a, a fork or a a spoon off of the off the table, and he'd bend it, sign it. He had a marker in his pocket, or his his brother in law Shippy always carried a you know a marker, a permanent marker. He would give him give him the marker, and he would sign the bowl of the spoon inside the bowl of the spoon and give it to the person. And they'd be really happy, you know. That's bizarre. Uh, it, it is. I don't know how it how he does it or how it works. I just know that in terms of just being uh, a really good guy, mm. I really liked him. Yeah. And I and I really loved his family. And you know, we used to do as I said, long walks along the Thames River. And you know, he had a at that time. I'm sure long gone now, uh, but he had a blind dog. And that blind dog would just go out and run circles around his voice. Wow. Just do like right hand turns all around that's his crazy. voice and these big circles. And, and that's what this this dog did. And he was just, he's just a really loving, you know, family guy. Mm. And, but never missed an opportunity to make a buck. And, huh, well, you know, what's wrong with that? Yeah. No, nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> so, what year was it then when um, Stanford Research Institute mm. was contracted by the defense? 73. 73. In 1973, after their proposal, uh, the agency apparently liked the lineup in terms of the talent, the researchers, and liked their proposal as to how they would do this work. And so they gave them a sole source contract. Now I'm a government contractor now. So to I know what, a, and I have a sole source contract now. And a, a sole source contract means that the government has determined that nobody else can do the work that you're doing. So instead Exclusive. of it being a competitive bid, they actually go, no, they write it up as such as it's a sole source you're the only one that's going to get this and you're going to get it for a certain period of time. That contract went on for them. Uh, I know now there are individuals and even some of them claiming that it, they had it, then it went somewhere else and it came back. Then, you know, when somewhere else came back, okay. I, I'm sure there are some fine points to it, but the issue was in 73, the sole source contract was let and they were given the mission to start to work in this and it was a pretty simple it was a complex set of deliverables but to distill them into like really simple lay language they were asked to do basically 
these things. First one was to to investigate, to experiment, to validate a human ability uh, to see something distant in space time, to actually do that, to prove that that capability exists, and to be able to establish that scientifically through their experimentation and their data analysis to prove that. That actually didn't take very long. I think within just short, just over one year, they came back and said, yes, absolutely, we have concluded uh, that this is a this is a, an ability within uh, within human beings to be able to see something distant in space time. So the whole idea of ESP was proven at that point. Now it's still controversial because naysayers would step still step back and they question the the methodology or the science or other things. But those are individuals that they have a. They have a, an ax to grind in that. They're, these are people that believe that there's nothing beyond the physical. So therefore, you know, anything that anybody produces that says there actually is something beyond the physical mm. and that you can, uh, you can connect with it and utilize it, right? How did they go about finding these individuals when they were doing this research? And how do you pick people that have this extrasensory perception? I think that... Uh, it, the first approach was just quite simply to <clears throat> to just ask, you know, who do you know? Yeah, who who do you know that has these abilities, or or, or purports to have these abilities? Right. So and it, you end up with Pat Price and you Ingo Swan and Yuri Geller and I'm and I'm sure they all know somebody else. I mean, so I I have even been told uh, by Tony Robbins. Uh, who my former wife works for, that Tony Robbins claims that he was. Uh, I remember you saying that in that yeah. podcast. Yeah, I, you know, I, I also, I don't, I can't verify that. I can just tell you that I've heard him say it. So, uh, and he endorsed my book. So Did know, he really? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he endorsed not Psychic Warrior, he endorsed uh, the Remote Viewing Manual book. It, you know, remote viewing, the complete user's guide to coordinate remote viewing. He endorsed that book along with Deepak Chopra uh, and a number of other wow. notables Yeah, that did that. So about a year ago, I started working with this company called Merrick Health, and I wanted to get a comprehensive breakdown of what was going on inside my body, from my vitamin levels to my lipid levels to my hormone levels, etc. Using the most elaborate and cutting edge testing on the market, they were able to advise me on a new diet, sleep, training, and supplement protocol designed to maximize performance and support longevity. I tell all my friends about Merrick Health because you simply cannot get this level of knowledge or attention to detail from a general practitioner who sees up to 50 patients per day. Plus, insurance companies regularly deny progressive treatment options. Primary care physicians refuse to order comprehensive lab work, and standards of care lag years behind the leading research. Merrick Health represents a paradigm shift in how we approach medicine, empowering those who want the most out of their health care and wish to maximize their potential. Every client who orders Merrick's optimization package receives extensive lab work, over 84 carefully selected biomarkers to help provide detailed insights into your hormone profile, cardiovascular health, organ function, and metabolic status. Expedited onboarding for those interested in working with a Merrick Health medical provider for personalized treatment options, ranging from hormone optimization and cognitive enhancement to hair loss prevention and body recomposition, and all from the comfort of home. Home. The Merrick Optimization Package includes the same elaborate panel I get myself. And with those test results, that's how the Merrick Health Clinical Team optimizes my personal protocol. If you want the same panel and medical oversight that I receive, go to MerrickHealth.com forward slash Danny and use the code Danny for 10% off at checkout. It's linked below. Now back to the show. Yeah. So but, was Tony a part of any of this stuff? Well, he claims he was. He claims he was. He claims that he was brought in and that they, you know, they were... Uh, that they tested him. And I'm sure that they brought in as many as they could get on any 10 buses. And then they just started running through a series of tests. And mm -hmm. when they thought that it was not something that they wanted to go further with those people, they just excused them. That's how they do that, right? They'll bring them in. They don't read them on to the program. They just bring them in and run them through a series of tests. And then 
they either keep them or they got it. jettison them. Okay. So what they ended up with were a number of people, but some that we know about now were Pat Price, Inga Swan, and Yuri Geller, and, and even Yuri did not stay there that long, right? Because mm -hmm. the there was a <clears throat> there were some there were challenges, and I'll explain that in a moment. It's so the next piece of the, you know the next deliverable, but shall we distill that down? Was can you tell us? who will be good at this like who do we look for what in the population what shows us that they have this a propensity for this why because if it's the cia that's doing this they want to know what do they harvest you know what from the human the, the u.s population who do they harvest at what ages do they harvest them and bring them in to spend them up and train them uh, to be capable of doing this so that they can use them as an intelligence collection methodology. And <clears throat> I think one of the most profound things that came out of this entire experiment was the fact that they concluded that this was not a, uh, an ability unique to anybody. It was, a, in fact, an ability inherent to every human being that every human being is born into this life with this capability, if developed, of being omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, right? Of understanding their eternal nature. And they didn't say it that way, but they said, this is a, an ability not unique to anybody. You don't have to get shot in a helmet like me. You don't have to have a heart attack. You don't have to have any kind of an, a near-death experience. You don't have to have any, you're born with this ability. Now, if you want to do the research, there is ample peer-reviewed research from a pediatric, psychiatric perspective that addresses this very thing, uh, particularly done in Scandinavia, mostly, but a lot of it in North America as well, wherein there are, they're, they're discovering that young children when they reach the age of being able to express these things, have an understanding of where they came from, why they're here, what they're supposed to be doing here. They have some remembrance of a, like a pre-existence or right? something else. And it is articulated and captured by those doing that research, uh, doing those studies. And those are, studied, those are published peer-reviewed studies. Like what? What do those kids say? <clears throat> where do they say they were, they were from and why they were here? Well, uh, that kind of detail, I, I really don't know. But what the, the genesis, I mean, I'm not the genesis, but the gist of those reports is just quite simply that these, these young male and female, these young children have said that they believe that they came from another place that was like a civilization, that it had order, that there were you know, decisions that were made, that there were, uh, you know, hands being raised to come into this existence, that kind of thing. And this is all published online? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Well, not online. Oh. This is not, a, this is not Google stuff. This is like peer-reviewed research. So okay. you could go to Google Scholar. Google Scholar and you okay, find it. Go to Google Scholar and start, you know, start looking for things that have to do with uh, pediatric psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry, dealing with uh, pre-existence or uh, knowledge of life before this life, things like that. Uh, that'll get you started, and then you can just start following it from there. There are there are hundreds, if not at this juncture, thousands of studies that have been published on this are you aware of any sort of studies on the human brain whether it be mri or something like that that basically scans the brain and finds like more active regions of the brain um that correlates between people who have these extrasensory abilities i know that it's been done uh i'm i'm not a brain researcher uh but i know that it's been done yeah i know there's this guy um dr gary Gary Nolan, he's actually from Stanford as well, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. And he uh, he did some research on people that had UFO encounters. Mm -hmm. And he 
um, did MRI scans of all their brains and he discovered that there was a certain region of their brain that was more dense in these people uh, and it was the basal ganglia. And what he also found is that it was heredit hereditary, that people in their family also had this same enlarged, more dense basal ganglia. And his idea <clears throat> is that that gave them more of a open perception or ability to see more of what's going on around us. And he theorizes that that's how <clears throat> these people are experiencing these things, whether it be UFOs or even paranormal phenomena. Is he saying that they're actually not being abducted, but that they're like transdimensionally experiencing this or what he speculates that yeah. i don't think he knows but um these people aren't necessarily abductees these are just people that see that have seen ufos or encountered some strange phenomena um a lot of them one of them is um a guy named jacques valet i met him yeah yeah <clears throat> i met jacques valet back in the uh 80s actually oh really yeah what was he like french <laughs> <laughs> he's very french yeah, yeah. and uh, all that that entails mm -hmm. you know uh <clears throat> i i met him with a a guy who later became one of my students uh ron blackburn who is dr ron blackburn a, a phd physicist i actually don't know if ron's still alive i i, I hope he is but ron went through every aspect of <clears throat> training with me and he was there that night i was there with ed and mel uh, myself obviously and we were at the abacu inn and we were there on tdy if you watch sean's uh podcast on that about the chaco canyon uh thing we were we were there tdy from the unit and we were trying to figure out why everybody had sketched this uh, uh, Chacoma Mountain. I mean, nobody labeled it Chacoma Mountain, but the the contour sketches that were done by the viewers matched the profile of that particular mountain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's uh, it's considered by the Pueblo and people to be like it's the like the center of the world is how they refer to it. Uh, and we thought that Chacoma Mountain was where we were going to see a lot of activity. And apparently we weren't the only ones that thought that or were being, you know, guided or driven to that place because here we are, you know, um, at the Abiquiu Inn and we go out that night with beers in hand and walk over across the street to this place to look over at Chacoma Mountain to kind of get out of the lights from, uh, from the hotel and everything else that's around. And back in the 80s, it was not well, not really populated at all. And there's two guys standing there. One of them's got this device with, you know, needles and, and lights and, you know, almost like something you'd see out of Ghostbusters. And that was Ron Blackburn. He had created this device that was measuring anomalous activity. And so, in other words, if there was an increase of energy or a decrease of energy or a spike of something, right? He was going to pick up on it so that's what he was doing and that's where he was and you know his running partner at that time was jacques valet and that's how i met him oh wow <clears throat> oh, that's what, strange coincidence yeah to yeah do speaking that. of coincidences i just had uh andy bustamante in here last weekend yeah who was on the big skinwalker beyond skinwalker ranch show and then i was looking you up and i discovered that you were on one of the episodes i had no clue uh, what was that like doing that? What, and what did they have you do specifically? Was it all like production or was any of that real? No, it was all real. Uh, but look, I have done television shows back in the nineties and in the early two thousands before I, I stopped having anything to do with remote viewing in like 2005. And I became vice president of operations of a, an operational medic, you know, medicine training company, because I just felt like I needed to do something as a soldier. I needed to do something. My country was at war, you know, and now we're at war on two battlefronts. And I 
needed to have some role. So I actually became aligned with a uh, an acquaintance who was an emergency physician, John Hagman, and uh, a Special Forces Captain Jeremy Hildall, uh, infantry officer, former Marine, who became vice president of support. So he was the logistician and the admin guy for the company. And I was the operations guy that dealt with the training and contracts, et cetera. And I had just, I got involved in that. And, you know, at, at one point it was a well over $14 million a year company and 96 employees. And, you know, we were training like 26,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines a year. And, but then we also did 22SAS, German KSK. I mean, you name it, we were training them, Naval Special Warfare Group, it, it, everybody. And what we were training, this whole new brand of medicine evolved at the start of the war, which is where for the very first time in the history of our military, we started giving war fighters uh, an individual, a, a first aid kit that actually had medical devices in it. And that had never been done before. And by medical devices, I mean like chest seals, hemostatic agents, pressure dressings, tourniquets, you know, wow. other things. And so if you're going to give somebody that, then the next thing is how do you train them to use all these things? And with the war amping up in the way that it was, the services turned around and went, we can't keep up. We, in the pre-deployment training requirements to train everybody in operational medicine, which was defined as actions at the point of wounding on the battlefield or tactical combat casualty care, we can't keep up with it. So it's going to have to go to contractors. We, we need to do that. So that's where the company that I was a part owner in and worked with, Deployment Medicine International, that's where that happened. Mm. And so as that's evolved, that started in 2004, 2005, I... I still do that to this day. Only I own a company that does that now, and we work for Department of State and, you know, Department of Energy and oh, wow. law enforcement agencies, etc. Right. Even after that whole book fiasco. <clears throat> what book fiasco? The Psychic Warrior. Oh well, that was that was in the '90s. This was happening well after that. So. Right, but I, 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 we'll get into that later. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to interrupt the flow right now. So that's you know that's what I. I, I went and did. So uh, teaching and talking about remote viewing is just not something I've done until recently. It's really just been like okay. since 2000, I mean, for 2021. Mm -hmm. I had a friend come back and say, hey, there's this new format, you know, Clubhouse, and you really ought to come on and do it. And so I started going on there and talking, and I, and I was doing like – literally 12 and 15 hour shows every night really i mean i'm not kidding i was like i was like a howard hughes pissing into uh, milk bottles and stuff <laughs> under the table i was like you know, is clubhouse not, even not still really. a thing i don't know i, have I don't no think idea. it's still alive i think it died <laughs> really I well i so. know they update the app all the time oh is the app still there oh yeah interesting okay i didn't know that well it was cool because uh, you know when you're on it i didn't want to be on something that you couldn't stop jerks from you know interjecting themselves into things you and like that no yeah i like the ability to stop it okay right? oh yeah yeah i don't i'm not gonna put up with that crap i mm -hmm. mean look i'm 69 years old i'm not you I'm really not. wow you look great for 69 man yeah. congratulations yeah, soldier yeah <laughs> right so it's like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put up with that from somebody yeah. i'm just too cantankerous mm -hmm. so i loved clubhouse because i would get on there and we'd be talking about what we were talking about. We published rules and we said, you know, here are the rules. If you're going to come in here, these are the rules. Don't violate these rules because if you do, uh, you know, I'm going to bounce you. And I had this amazing suite of, uh, mo you know, moderators that were, were working there and they were good. They knew just, they could tell by the inflection of my voice if I was at the point of like, I'm done with this guy or this girl, right? I'm done with your wokeness. And they would just push the jettison button and they would be gone. I like that. I mean, they were gone. And if they came back, which they can do, mm -hmm. they, they bump them off the stage. But if they come back, they have the ability then to ban them from the room. And if they ban them, then that means that any room I'm in, 
they can't be a part of. They can't be part of that. And I, I like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I liked it because I'm not going to get into a screaming match with somebody about something. You can either, you, you, you can listen to what I have to say. And if you don't like it, go form your own room on mm-hmm. Clubhouse and, right. and talk about what you don't like about right. what I said. But don't come in and think you're going to talk over me because, hey, I'm not a millennial. So mm-hmm. I, I'm going to burn you down. It's combat flying operations. You know, I'm not going to put up with that. Right. It makes no sense to me Right. to get into the screaming match about stuff like that. It's just. So, so what exactly were you doing with Andy at Skinwalker Ranch? I got a phone call from one of the producers that said, Hey, we're doing this thing. And I have done these shows for history channel before. And, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of them. I mean, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, they did like, you know, Proof Positive, Beyond Belief, History Channel, Nova, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of different things. And they were often these things of, well, we want to see if remote viewing really works, so we bring in remote viewers. I mean, one of the, they're all out there. And it was just about remote viewing and about, you know, people I had trained and they were putting them to the test and then they would bring somebody in to be kind of a proctor to make sure there was no cheating and that kind of stuff. And uh, it, like you asked, we started this off talking about, you know, a police department and we trained in an entire police department I did. And then we ended up in Carteret, New Jersey. Then we ended up having an entire television crew come in and do a television show about a missing person that was there. And uh, and what the remote viewers produced, that kind of stuff. And that's all out there. It's It can be found or it might be on my uh, YouTube channel. But so I was, you know, I, un- I understood that stuff and I'd done it. But I also understood how complex it was. And I also understood that it's a, an entire show. It's not a, it's not a six minute, you know, segment, segment of right. 43 minutes, right? right? It's right. just not going to be that. And so when they asked me to come in and do it, I was really upfront with them and said, this is going to be an enormous amount of data. And I brought in 70 remote viewers from seven different nations uh, around the world. And we worked three different targets and it was over 10,000 pages of data, uh, which amount, you know, amounted to you know, uh, like 25, 30,000 data points. And then you have to distill that all down. And then you have to also try to figure out how you're going to present that on, you know, on air to them. So they asked, (laughs) they brought me in and I can still remember them. I've got all the data and it's, it's there and I've distilled it down to probably two hours worth of stuff mm-hmm. and they're like oh no no we don't want to talk about that oh no, no not that no let's not go over that no no so all that verbal sensory data was all removed and they only wanted the visual which i got because yeah it's entertainment right yeah and even that they said well okay we're going to do a 20 minute camera shoot 30 minutes tops well four and a half hours later i finish and they're like they're, yeah, they're about half pissed off because they didn't they didn't think that they were going to be there for four and a half hours <laughs> listening to me talk. I mean, every this shit just these changed. guys are union. Whole, they're paying they're paying oh high God, dollar yes. for that. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, first of all, the camera batteries died, so right. they had to change you know time out. We got to change yeah. camera batteries, yeah. and then the sun went down, and they hadn't planned on being there. No so they had No lighting. <laughs> so now it's like take a break. We got to bring in lights. And they had three cameras. It was a three camera shoot. Oh wow! And then they did all of this stuff, and they got all the you know all of this stuff being produced, and you know. <clears throat> When Travis and Eric were briefed on it, they were like, according to the producer who talked to me, it was like, we should have known this. We should have known this before we went in there and did, you know, did our experiments. We should have known this stuff before we did that, you know, not after the fact. So I don't, I, which I was, I, I was happy about that because yeah, if you're going to do this, it, this needs to be utilized as like an enigma penetration. It's like, how long can you say to people, 
oh, geez, that's unusual, and I don't know why that's doing that, right? Uh, that's really weird that this is happening, or, you know, what's that? The remote viewers were always, as an intelligence collection methodology, they were always, they always kept up their end of the bargain. They're just one, one more cog in the intelligence collection machine, right? And what they produced was information that was usable in the intelligence collection machine. There's not an intelligence collection methodology that's 100% accurate. None of them are. None of them. And so, uh, you know, to bring in remote viewers and utilize them, it's one more, it's one more piece of the puzzle that you probably cannot glean by some other means. And so applying that in this beyond Skinwalker Ranch uh, with this particular Colorado ranch, to do that, it was, it was like an enigma penetration. It gave answers to the, 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 the studies or the, the experiments that they were doing. It gave potential answers to that, at least answers that should be considered. And I think that, that, you know, that, that struck a bone for them. It was like, yeah, you know, this is good. But they also came back and said, look, we, we just don't have enough, we don't have enough space in the episode to put all the stuff that you produced into that. So we just, we timed, uh, colored and edited like eight minutes. And we're just gonna put that on the, on the website for everybody to see. But now they just got picked up for a second season. Mm -hmm. So they came back and said, yeah, now we wanna, we wanna look at another way to apply this now. Right. So we're in discussions for doing that kind of stuff. But So when you're remote viewing, and you have to pardon my, my ignorance, I know, I know jack shit about this. You're stupid. Exactly. I mean, like the guy told you. All right, right? Jack. Just, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm, I've been studying I, this for 50 years. Yeah, you're you know nothing. To believe me. You just, <laughs> just do what I say. You're stupid. You're like a peasant mind. <laughs> um, so when you're remote viewing this stuff, can you, can you go back in time? and see what happened somewhere at a certain time? Or can you just go like, I'm gonna go to East Africa right now and see what's going on in the, in the Namibian desert, like at this moment. How, and, and when you're doing it, how does the information come to you? Okay, uh, two really good questions. And uh, the, I'm gonna start with the latter part of your question, which okay. was, how does it come to you? Yeah. And understand that as a scientist um, and, and a physicist uh, it is, and as a special operations soldier, it, it, this is all theoretical. I mean, there's no way to actually, nobody's ever yet truly proven how human beings do this. But here's the theoretical interpretation of this. Okay. So it deals with a quantum and, and what we're borrowing from is quantum mechanical interpretations quantum mechanical physics the interpretations of that uh and we're borrowing those interpretations you do know what i mean by interpretations yeah. like okay so science is not absolute despite the fact that jack or others might try to make it out to be and the greatest physicists and mathematicians among us are very clear on that and they're very honest. You know, the Nobel Prize winners and the Temple Award winners and other things in physics, they are very keen to make sure that, that people understand that, that everything we think we know about the world around us and the physics that explains it and the mathematical proofs that we use to back up those physics interpretations, could all be bullshit tomorrow afternoon, right? Because they're all based on just what we know now. And when we input or change variables in the equations, everything changes. Right. The whole outcome changes. The whole interpretation and understanding of it changes. So in the world of quantum mechanical physicists and theoretical physicists in general, they understand this and accept that and preach it. Maybe a few don't, but uh, you know, experimental physicists have a tendency to think that 
the world is in absolutes. In fact, I recently uh, had a dialogue with a uh, with an experimental physicist who who said to me very clearly that his his role in the world is to prove theoretical physicists wrong, which in truth that is his role. You know, there may be ten theoretical physicists that come up with various concepts, and his job is to secure grants to prove or disprove those. He's not necessarily attacking those individuals, right. but his that's, job is that's to, science. Yeah, science. But whenever you start to hear people speaking in terms of absolutism, right? Mm -hmm. It's this, absolutely this. It's it. That's the wrong approach in science. And why? Because I know it. Yeah, because I know it. So just believe me. Uh, <laughs> You shut up because <laughs> you don't know anything. It's the Copernican principle. <laughs> that was the best. I, that was the best laugh I had had in a very long time. Yeah, me too, I, man. Like I said, I swear I had that guy in college. I mean, I've, I, I've had that guy, you know, in front. Of, so, well, there's a recording of him actually at SRI with Hal Putoff and uh, some people in the CIA where they're talking about Yuri Geller, and and he's in there talking to them. I don't know where it goes beyond that, but. That's the one thing he actually that was solid. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it's been a while. <laughs> good for him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's so when you're you're talking about these quantum mechanical principles and then you're borrowing those and applying them in, into interpretations of quantum mind. In some scientists minds, you're you're creating a bridge and treading on ground that has no basis in fact whatsoever and that's okay I, i'm not saying this to you to try to to win people like that over i, I really couldn't care less i mean <clears throat> where don't let me forget where i am in this but i want to just digress for a minute okay there is a reason why some people are accepting of these things and some aren't I, and my first exposure to this was back in uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, CNN had done a poll <clears throat> of like 2,000 respondents in the poll. And the poll was, uh, how many of you believe that there's something beyond the physical? So what they were barking up was, do you believe in God or do you believe in an, an afterlife or do you something else? It was just a a poll that for whatever reason, and I'm flying and I'm looking at this in an, in an airline magazine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it caught my attention. And the question out of the 2000, out of the 2000, essentially, you know, 98% of the people said, I believe that there's something beyond the physical. 2% said, I don't believe there's anything beyond the physical. You, you, you live, you die, that's it. You know, you rot in the ground, finished, done. Mm -hmm. I don't care about that perspective. And I don't consider it my obligation or my mission in life to try to convert that two percent of you know of that of the population to do that this same poll has been recently been duplicated uh, it gets duplicated every year by pew research and they've done it and the numbers that i'm going to quote to you have not changed significantly over the years until recently the last three polls uh they've changed and the two percent has now become like five percent, or in some cases seven percent. Oh, it's growing. It, it, yeah, of I don't believe there's anything right, right kind of thing. But there's bags of meat that die, and yeah. And but when you look at it, when you you look at who they're adding into that study, predominantly the thing that really pluses that up is China because they don't believe in in that, but they can they believe they're confucius right so they believe in things like luck and harmony and you know and good and good karma, will, karma. Mm -hmm. they believe in those kinds of things so that in and of itself in my opinion disqualifies them as disbelievers they just don't accept you know uh, a white guy with long hair and a beard you know they got crucified on a cross or you know, some guy that lives in the sky somewhere that, you know, threw stone tablets to Moses and that kind of thing. They don't believe in that. Okay, bravo. But you believe in something that's unseen. And if you're believing in harmony and karma and stuff, you're believing in something that's beyond the physical, right? Because that's not 
physical. That's not tangible. That's right. not. And, and so it, it does. It disqualifies you in my book. You could split a hair on that. I don't care. It, it's just my opinion on okay. it. So out of the 2% that don't think there's anything beyond the physical, there's 98% that believe that there's something beyond the physical. The 98% that said, I believe there's something beyond the physical got asked the second question. The second question was, do you believe that you will ever realize what that is? And while you're alive in this physical life, that you will ever touch it, interact with it, learn from it, contribute to it, right? understand it mm -hmm. and other whatever it is that's beyond the physical do you believe that that will ever happen for you and out of the 98 percent, now push that to 100 for the statistics here it was 70 uh 76 percent said no i don't believe i will ever realize it understand it see it touch it hear from it or contribute to it etc like it's something i believe is out there but i don't believe i'll ever realize it and okay. i guess it's just, i'll just i'll see when i die if it's out there the 24 percent same came back and said yeah i do believe i do believe that i can reach it that i can interact with it that i can be part of it that it's part of me etc cetera, etc cetera. Sorry to interrupt, but this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Verso. We all know how important it is to get the right amount of nutrition, exercise, and sleep as we age. It's something I'm really passionate about and have discussed at length with doctors and nutritional scientists on this podcast. That is why I use Verso. Verso is a company dedicated into translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. I take cell being every day to help combat aging by increasing my NAD levels with powerful ingredients such as NMN, transresveratrol, and TMG. NAD plus is arguably one of the most powerful molecules in the body, but declines with age. Keeping NAD plus levels high helps guide longevity genes called sirtuins. Sirtuins are called longevity genes because by activating them, they support overall health and slow down aging related effects by regulating important processes inside of cells. High NAD plus levels can improve your metabolism, repair damaged DNA, and ramp up energy production in your brain, immune system, and muscles. Now you can't take NAD plus as a supplement because it's too big for the cells to absorb. But NMN directly converts to NAD plus, while resveratrol activates your sirtuins, which increases their attraction for NAD. These two molecules act synergistically and increase your NAD plus more than just NMN on its own. Verso also publishes third-party testing from each batch produced to absolutely guarantee you're getting what you pay for. Head on over to ver.so and use the coupon code DANNY, it's spelled D-A-N-N-Y, to save 15% off your entire order or just go to ver.so forward slash DANNY. Back to the show. It's the 24% of the people that are important to the equation and the 76 percent are also important to the equation because they are people that are that can be changed that can be transformed if they're shown something that 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 chew that takes them from this place of believing that there's something beyond the physical and actually puts them into a perspective of now knowing it and to know it that's the transformation that changes people's lives knowing it is the thing to know it and you can only know it through the actual doing of it and the physical and the non-physical okay and as a remote viewer trained in the protocols of remote viewing that were intelligence collection modality right protocols that is the thing that transforms you and it was that's a whole nother subject but that transformation is a is a poignant event in a human's life to go from believing that there's something beyond the physical because believing is easy we all believe something that part's easy there's not even the ones that believe there's nothing the operative word is believe mm -hmm. right so we all believe and need and they can't prove that there is or prove that there isn't. But in this protocol of remote viewing, when I stepped into it to learn it, I didn't believe it and I had no reference for it. I was there because I admitted that I had some weird thing happen to me when I got shot in a helmet in Jordan, right? As a Ranger Company commander. 
that's how I ended up being there. I had no, uh, I didn't claim that I was that I was uh, clairvoyant or that I'd anything like that. I had never ever said that in my life ever. I had, I, I never even I didn't even use the word psychic, you know, unless I was you know, talking about something in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. I had no idea what any of this was, but now I step into this place where everybody there has got some preconceived notion that they are this or they are that, but not me. I'm just a special operations, you know, infantry officer, but now here I am. The only one that ever actually, you know, darkened the doorway there and the only one that was ever trained in those protocols. And so I, I fought against it and I was, as a scientist, very, very questioning and analytical about what I was learning and how I was learning it and whether or not I believed their analysis of my work, et cetera. And it just went on that way for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then about two and a half months into it, you get to the point where the targets and the data collection are so complex and so thorough that you can't just dismiss it away anymore. It gets to the point where you start going like, shit, this couldn't have happened because you're only given two sets of four numbers. You're not given a, a wink, wink, this is what it is, or, you know, it might be this, or think Colosseum, you know, in, uh, in, uh, on, on the Mediterranean kind of thing. It's not a hint. They give you nothing. They give you two sets of four numbers. <clears throat> I'll explain that in a minute. But because that leads into how you're able, how this comes to you as a remote viewer. The, so the point just to re, to backstop or, or to back up on this is number one, it's an ability that we all have. We're born with it. It's nothing unique. <clears throat> the protocols that were developed for the CIA DIA program were developed to standardize the approach that everybody took to the intelligence collection, right? They wanted to make sure that it was uniform, that the data came in the categories that they were looking for the data to come in. They wanted to make sure that the summaries were all the same for everybody, uh, that sketches were probed and labeled, et cetera, so that it was usable intel. And then it was compiled by the program manager. It was put together. A grand summary was developed, and then it was sent up to the DIA because at that point it was called all source intel. All source intel means uh, they get this request from a customer. Let's just say maybe it's the Navy, <clears throat> maybe it's the CIA. And what they do is they're not selective about, well, we think this intel method would be best for this. All source intel means it just goes out to everybody. Here's, our, here's the collection task. This is the mission. Everybody decide how you need to do this, but you know all your input is due by this date it. or it'll be ongoing. So that's how it happened. And viewers were uh, as effective as any of the rest of them. If they hadn't been, they would have cut it off and closed it down a long time ago, You know, not kept it going for 20 years before I wrote a book. And then... It's still going, ongoing today, despite the fact that I know many of my former colleagues are trying to say, oh, no, it's not. But yeah, it is. They wouldn't have killed it. It says it was valuable back then. It's valuable now, and they're still doing it. They wouldn't have killed it. What do you mean by that? They wouldn't have killed the program. They alleged that when they knew the book was coming out, they knew the book was going to come out in you know, circa 93. I was writing the book, 93. And I had been paid in advance. And I was an active duty army officer when the book Psychic Warrior was contracted for. Well, the agency in those days <clears throat> keeps, keeps people uh, on the payroll. They're not working directly for the CIA, but they're, they're told to keep their eyes open. And in all of the publishing houses, there were people in those days uh, that if a book came across, you know, came in it, it, somewhere, even if they weren't part of the team working that book, they would hear about that book. And if they heard about that book, they would take 
they would try to get copies of the proofs or the galleys of or so you're parts saying of, you're saying the cia had like agents spread around in various different publishing houses and media houses and i'm sure like newspapers and stuff like that yeah and absolutely to and make sure nothing and because the one thing that in those days <laughs> that they were grossly afraid of was what was called at that point durable media mm. so I mean, in those days, uh, you know, email was just getting started. Right. <clears throat> there was no social media. Uh, people really didn't have access to the internet. Uh, so that whole idea was not something that they were concerned with. Uh, having a news show or, a, you know, 2020 or 60 Minutes do an expose on it. That was here today, gone tomorrow kind of a thing, uh, just because of the attention span of human beings right. but a book uh, if you tell a secret in a book it's there forever it's never going to go away and once once it's published and it's out there they can't make it go away they can't stop it they can't stop a publisher from publishing it they can't do any of those things god knows they tried as soon as they found out that i was doing that and i was doing that not because of profit or anything else. I was doing it because I believed that the transformative effect of learning this was important enough that it might actually change the direction of human destiny if enough people were to make that transition from believing to knowing, if that makes sense. Because that's the most powerful transition you can make in this life is to go from believing to knowing something. That's, a, that's, some, that's something that doesn't happen very often in our existence, mm. right? So that's why the book was written. But, and you know, you know the story about what they did to try to shut that down. And well, you didn't go through the, uh, did you go through the standard protocol to get a book published? You, you, so you were active army what, yeah. what was your official title at that at that time i was the uh training officer for the 82nd airborne division i had just come out of a battalion where i was an interim battalion commander uh i turned over that battalion to the guy who is now secretary um uh, secretary of state he was the battalion commander that He's came in. current secretary of state <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He came in and uh, he was uh, the individual that took command of that battalion. I took it after the battalion commander left and there was a gap. So I became an interim battalion commander. I was still a major. And then after that was done, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division headquarters. And there are what are called three iron majors. They call them iron majors. I don't know why they do that, but there is the director of ops, the director of plans, and the director of training. And my forte had always been training, so director of training is where I went. And so I was now the director of training and uh, one of those three majors. And that's, I had I actually contracted for the book when I was an interim commander, battalion commander, and, uh, and then was finishing working on the book when I was the director of training. And the proper, there's a protocol for when you're doing this, for whether you're in the military or whether you're in intelligence or the FBI, when, when you're publishing a book, I know, I, the only reason I know this is because I've talked to many uh, former CIA officers who have written books and they always say they have to send the book in. Sometimes it takes a year, two years to get it reviewed, make sure there's nothing to classify, nothing classified that has to be redacted, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You didn't do any of that. You just published. No, because what I was talking about was classified, and I knew that. So you knew you were going to get fucked. I knew I was going to get fucked. I just, to be honest with you, I didn't think I was going to get fucked that hard. <laughs> so, I mean, I, what I actually, in my naivete at that point, I mean. How old were you? <clears throat> oh, uh, 35. Oh, wow. 38. Okay. And if I had not done that, if I had not written that book, I would have, I would have probably been a general. I mean, I mean, there are not very many officers that have 
you know, two general officers write on their efficiency reports. You know, one of them wrote, <clears throat> uh, who was the guy that reformed First Ranger Battalion, Kenneth C. Lure, as Major General wrote, destined to wear stars, you know? Uh, Which means you're a general if you wear star, if you wear stars. <laughs> destined to wear stars, yeah. To be, a, he, this guy is going to be a general. I mean, generals don't do that for young officers very often. I mean, that I know of. I'm, I, I mean, I, I just don't know of him doing it. And I was, I never like believed the, I, I never believed the press about myself. I, I mean, in retrospect, as an older man now, I look back on it and go, yeah, you know, if I, if I hadn't stepped on it the way I did, I probably would have been, I would have been a general. Uh, and a four-star general, right, you know, wrote, will be chief of staff of our army one day. Wow. <laughs> so those are pretty significant, you know, uh, proclamations by individuals wearing stars about the potential of an officer to be that. And uh, I wasn't that because I was special. I was that because I was, I was raised by... Uh, you know, I was a third generation army officer. My son is now a command sergeant major. It's in our DNA, you know, it's in our DNA to serve the Republic. And it's really all I wanted to do ever. And it was my greatest love and the best years of my life were in uniform. And, uh, I had the greatest mentors that any young officer could have ever had i mean kenneth c lure i mean what kind of young lieutenant grows up under a guy who was the guy that creighton abrams you know went to and said i want i'm going to give you the creighton abrams charter which is i want you ken lure lieutenant colonel uh just out of vietnam i want you to reform a first ranger battalion the first ranger battalion right Wow. That had, that had been in existence since, really, uh, World War II and uh, some semblance of it in Korea. But it was like, and now, in 74, he brings this up. Interesting story. I have, uh, I'm, sp I'm writing uh, Ken Luer's uh, biography. Oh, wow. And uh, in one of my interviews with him, uh, he's... Uh, he suffers from now from dementia and uh it's uh it's taken a, a, t a huge toll on him but <clears throat> before uh that really got hold of him in the interviews he he said to me one time he goes uh you know why uh i was i was given that mission and told i only had six months to to stand the battalion up and certify him i went you know it did seem like a pretty short timeline to me. You know, you're given, you're be like me coming to you and saying, okay, I'm now as chief of staff of the army, giving you this piece of paper that says, go form a ranger battalion. It's roughly 700 men. Take your pick for non-commissioned officers and officers from the entire army. You go find the best you can find and you bring them back here and you form them into a battalion. Mm -hmm. You give them their lineage, their creed, their everything. You create all of that. And then you make sure you, they are ready to go in six months' time. He told me <laughs> that the reason that Creighton Abrams did that is because the Rangers were going to be the force to remove the president from the White House. Think. Think the timelines now and tell me who it was. You weren't even born yet. We're talking about 63? <laughs> talking about 74. Oh, 74. Nixon. <clears throat> what? Yeah. Uh, at that time, and it's you can check the sources on it, but the, the chiefs of staff and the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff stopped talking to President Nixon. They refused to dialogue with him. They, after he had been, you know, was on the process of impeachment and what had happened and the lies and the other things that had gone on and he was getting drug addled and, you know, other things that were going on. It, it, they, he had just lost his credibility as the president, as the commander in chief to the joint chiefs. 
And when that happens, they just stopped. They stopped going to the White House. They stopped giving briefings. They stopped responding. Things were shutting down. It was getting more serious than any of us were led to believe that it was. And I, I know that the 82nd Airborne Division at that time uh, was put there was there's always a battalion that's on alert meaning supposed to be like 16 hours wheels up there was an element of the 82nd airborne division that was told that they were on alert and their mission was they were going to go to washington dc they could have jumped in or they could have air landed which is probably what it would have happened and they were going to be used as a cordon force so they would have circled the White House, and they would have, I know this sounds fantastic, right? It sounds ridiculous, but I have no reason to doubt a two-star general, and I do know for a fact that the 82nd was put on alert for this very thing. That I know. What were they going to do? <clears throat> they were going to cordon off the White House. The Rangers were going to be the force that came in to remove the president if he did not resign they were going to remove him from a the coup? White House. Uh, yes. I, I, I mean, I'm sure that there was political leadership behind it as well. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, but I'm telling you, I've told this to people who have said to me, even fellow Rangers, and I mean by Rangers, I mean guys that served in the regiment who have just gone like, you want, you're really going to say that? And I go, Absolutely, I'm going to say that because I think that's a part of our history, both our national history of our republic and a history of the army, you know, and the Joint Chiefs, because all of the Joint Chiefs, that means, you know, Navy, uh, the Marine Corps, the Army, right, Air Force, all of them were aware of this. And that was a plan. It, it didn't, it didn't get executed, but. So, yes. So this, to recap, this four-star general who you're writing the biography for, he's the one who told you this. Has anyone else? He's a two-star. Oh, he's a two-star general. <clears throat> and has anyone else corroborated this? Uh, no. Okay. But what ha what has been established is, and you can look it up. There are a number of books that talk about the 82nd Airborne Division during this time being put on alert, and about the fact that the chiefs of the services refused to talk to the White House and that there was a plan for a military intervention to remove him from the White House if he did not resign. Wow. The, the, the details of the Rangers was classified, and I'm sure it's still classified to this day, but if somebody tells me something like that, I want to be a purveyor of truth, and I have no reason whatsoever to doubt this general who told me this at all. I mean, no reason to doubt him. He's the finest officer, you know, that I ever served under in, uh, in the army. He's the guy that created the Rangers. And he told me that that was the reason that he was given six months to stand them up and certify them as ready. And he did. And the chief of staff of the army gave him that task it wasn't like it came down on orders filtered down from on high to you've been selected to form a new command this was creighton abrams the chief of staff of the army standing in front of a lieutenant colonel going this is your charter oh, and by the way shit. weird right I that mean, is, when do you hear stuff like that? Well, I'll tell you, I never have heard it. I mean, I just had a guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of, his, heard of him, John Newman. He's a writer. He, um, he was a consultant for Oliver Stone on the first JFK movie and also the recent JFK movie he did. This guy, I think he's like the only guy who has officially reviewed all however many million it's like uh, two million documents that have been declassified yeah, on it yeah, yeah. this guy's dedicated his entire life to researching this stuff and he's published probably eight books on it <clears throat> and he was just in here like a month ago and um he discovered who there there was a, a mole in the cia um during when when oswald was sent to russia to defect 
uh, there was a KGB mole in the CIA. He found out who the KGB mole was and he like released it in his book. And basically, I, you know, his whole theory on all of that is that it was a, it was a, a military coup and the CIA was just cover up. Like a lot of people th think the CIA <laughs> killed Kennedy. All the stuff that he read, he found out about secret JSOC meetings in September of 1963 in Hawaii. Yeah, except JSOC didn't exist then. So it had to have been something else. Joint Special Operations Command, they, they didn't even have the term. Or Joint Chiefs of Staff. Okay. Yeah, that, I guess, that, I got that, that wrong. existed. Okay, right. sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So so those guys were meeting in, in, in secret in Hawaii like the, the month before, and there was stuff that was yeah. said, and all kinds of crazy plans that were going. It had to do with Vietnam. Anyways, his his whole perspective on it is that it was a military coup. Yeah, I mean, it sounds I see, a lot like what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. I, I see the book up here, the JFK Revisited. Yeah. And I actually knew very well Jim Mars, the guy that wrote the first book, um, you know, uh, JFK, The Plot That Killed Kennedy, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, which is the book that Oliver Stone optioned for the first movie, JFK. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jim Mars now sadly passed, but. Uh, uh, it was interesting to be at Daily Plaza and, and to be there with Jim Mars and let Jim Mars talk to you about, you know, go through all the things. I have always been convinced, and I really like the new documentary and the, this new book, mm -hmm. JFK Revisited. Right, right. Because not that I, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I am not. I just am not. Just a remote viewer, okay? There's a difference. Just a remote viewer. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and mostly I'm a teacher of remote viewer and a guy that talks about it. But... Uh, uh, I am, I'm convinced that, you know, what, what, what we have been fed is not, you know, it's not the story. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really like that version more so than some of the other versions, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now you asked me quite some time ago, like, how does remote viewing work? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I went through that whole and took you down some different rabbit holes and I apologize for doing that, but it's kind of my nature. Uh, well, <clears throat> maybe while we're on this whole military thing, you know, we just kind of discussed your military background and all that. Um, can you explain before we go into actually how it works? Let's talk about how you first discovered it and how you were how you were personally brought into it. And I think that goes back to your <clears throat> deployment in Jordan, doing your or you're doing training in Jordan, right? Yeah, I was uh, a Ranger Company commander, <clears throat> and uh, y you know, to be a Ranger Company commander, you have to have been a commander elsewhere successfully before before you actually even get invited to uh, to the Ranger Battalion or the Ranger Regiment. When I first got there, they were still forming the regiment. It was right after Grenada, and. Uh, so they were still sorting that out. So I got there. I was a, uh, I was the deputy operations officer. So like the deputy S two. I mean S three. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then after that, <clears throat> I was given command. I was going to get command of a Charlie company. And the the battalion XO came to me, Jack Nix, who went on to be a four star general, and said, "Hey." You know, this this other guy has been in the S1 shop as the personnel officer. He's been there like for a year. And now you just got stepped over him to take this command of this company. It would be really, it would be a good, you'd be doing a real solid. And, you know, uh, if you just backed off, let him take that and you go take the S1 job. And that's what I did. So the S1, that captain went to command Charlie company and I took the S1 position. Because my secondary specialty was 41, which was every officer has their primary and then their secondary. My secondary was personnel management. And you did that because if you were going to be anywhere, you wanted to be, if you weren't going to be with troops, commanding troops, you wanted to be in a place where you could maximize benefit for it. And the place to be was to be in, uh, in personnel management at the Hoffman building because you'd be You'd be the guy sitting on and forming promotion boards and, you know, other kinds of things. You you would understand the whole way in which that works behind the scenes. So a lot of generals had been personnel managers as 41s as a secondary specialty. 
and I wanted to go do that. So I did that. And uh, so I was the S1, which I fucking hated. I mean, I hated that job. I mean, I just really, I hated being the S1. It was like the most thankless, you know, detail-oriented uh, counting people and statistics kind of a job and, and, and reporting to regiment at the same time reporting. It was like dates of rank and dates of assignment and other stuff of uh, briefing the battalion commander all the time about who was getting ready to leave, who was going to be here, who was not uh, in terms of officers. I fucking hated it. I mean, <laughs> I could have opened a vein if I had been there much longer, <laughs> I swear. And so then I finally, you know, like a year later, get a company and I'm, uh, I'm commanding my company, and I commanded my company a, a, a long time. I commanded my first company for almost two years. And that's unusual because usually a company command is like 12 months, and then you're, there, you're out of there because they need to get another captain plugged in to get some time. But in Panama, I, I commanded the Army's only separate airborne rifle company. It was, it was a trip. I mean, it was... It was the only separate airborne rifle company in the U.S. Army. It was all by itself. In 3rd Battalion, 5th Infantry, it was an Alpha Company airborne. It was an airborne company down in, in Panama. That, nowadays, it's an entire battalion, I understand. But in those days, it was one company. And you were considered, you know, in those days, they called it the RRF, Ready Reaction Force. But it... It's now called Quick Reaction Force. And you were the Quick Reaction Force of, force of the Commander-in-Chief Southern Command, the four-star mm -hmm. that was at Quarry Heights. And I commanded that for two years and then came to the Rangers. And I wanted to stay there for two years. And I was always known as a, a trainer, you know, as a, as a, a detailed trainer. And again... So not something I cooked up on my own. It's something that I learned from Lure, the guy that formed the Rangers. And all of the guys that gathered around him down in Panama, the Stringhams, you know, the, the, the others that were guys that came out of the 1st Battalion, Ranger Battalion, were down there. And so I learned from all these guys and Wes Taylor and Hartzog and, you know, Emery Mace. Wow. I had these, these, these battalion commanders were guys I served under and they were all just fucking amazing, you know, as leaders and mentors and teachers, uh, some much better than others. But, uh, so that made me really good at training and understanding the mechanism of training. And so in doing that, then, uh, I, have, my company is chosen to go to the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. First time, the U.S. Army Ranger Company has ever gone. All eyes on this. And, of course, they go to the Ranger Regiment and go, don't send a fuck up. You know, it, it has to be a good company and they have to be good at what they're doing. Don't send, you know, whatever's available kind of a thing. We've always been friends with Jordan, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Yes, yes. And, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Jordan was, uh, it's an Arab nation, obviously, and uh, they only have two enemies. They don't like Syria, and Syria never liked them, which is another Arab country. So there was friction between the two of them. <clears throat> and then, of course, they hate Israel. Still to this day. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Uh, to this day. I, I mean... Well, that puts us in a tough position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes. And, you know, I understood that, you know, we're going there to train them to do what? We're training them, you know, in combat operations. We're there to train them in live fire exercises, you know, company deliberate attack, platoon movement to contact, platoon attack, uh, deliberate attack, and squad movement to contact, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to be doing this out in the in, in the to desert. To protect them from Syria? I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> okay. look, I, I, all I can tell you is that the, they were called Jordanian Rangers, and there was one battalion of them. Okay. And I... 
I was there as a company commander with my battalion commander and you know I had a an additional platoon attached to me so instead of three rifle platoons I had four rifle platoons plus I had my standard headquarters platoon etc we were there uh, <clears throat> and we were training them just to train them but I was very clear on what we were really doing because this battalion commander would stand on the Hodge Road, the rod, road to Mecca, my entire company, you know, sitting in the sand, listening to him speak. And he would speak in perfect English and he would pull his nine millimeter Beretta out and point it towards Israel and fire off a couple of rounds and, and, and tell the story about how he just hated them and how they would, you know, they would attack them at, at, at a drop of any hat. And you were like, I'm looking around because I actually had three Jewish kids in my, in my company. I had three Jews in the company. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So, and the Jewish Mossad actually used Jordan as like their final graduation. So Mossad actually has a requirement to penetrate into Jordan and navigate I don't know how far, let's just say like a hundred miles. You have to be, you have to navigate a hundred miles in enemy territory and then come back in again. So we were told that that could happen, that you would see that. And all the time when we were there at night, because I had uh, translators that were with me that were Americans, we'd be scanning the radio nets and listening to what was happening. We'd hear, we would hear Israelis uh, you know, talking and maneuvering and doing different stuff about, you know. So who were we there? What well, we were there, there training them to do? One or two, two things or both things. Be prepared to combat Syria if they needed to and to kill Israelis. And there's, there are no, I mean, that sounds like a horrible thing to say and to know that you were maybe part of that. And I'm sure that, the army would not like to hear me say that, but come on, what else were we there to do? You know? But I'm just trying to figure out why we would do that. It's, uh, it's relationships. You're building relationships. You're there. You're not, nobody would ever say that. I mean, it wouldn't be on a, on a set of orders. Right. Go to Jordan, train a Jordanian Ranger battalion to kill Israelis and to prepare for combat operations against Syria. Mm -hmm. No, but I'm just speaking honestly, what right. would we be doing there? Right, That's right. what we were doing there. Okay. So if you're training Jordanians to, to kill. There's only two people they want to kill. There's only two sets of folks they want to kill. Right. You know, So uh, they're not gonna invade China or do something like that. They're not heading for Manchuria. They're, well, I don't think they have a fucking snowball's chance in hell and fighting with Israel either. I, no, they don't. <laughs> But they, in that day, and I to this day, I'm I'm sure, they still have <clears throat> all along their their shared border. They have uh, command posts. They it's like it's like uh, it's like you would expect to see, uh, you know, uh, back in the days of the Templars and you know the, in the Crusades. You know, they're they're watching the the east west routes through these wadis mm -hmm. and, you know these big famous wadis you know wadi musa wadi hamra wadi uh, they're they're watching them they have command posts that are up there and they're sitting there with you know radios and binoculars and you know telescopes and they're watching to make sure that the israelis are not lining up on the border to come in as if the israelis had any intention to do that right right uh which they don't but yeah they 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 hate them and right. so, uh, at, well, at least their military hates them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe in the being there in the eighties was, I guess it, maybe it was just too soon since you know, the last, last fight they had had with them, which was in the sixties, but they were prepared to go at any, at any moment. They were very concerned about, was uh, that the six day war? <clears throat> yeah. But, but Jordan was involved in that. They were involved. In they that. were okay. involved. Okay. In okay. That. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was uh, it was just an interesting experience to be there doing that. But during one of the training exercises, uh, 
which was involved. We had like uh, a, a, a a huge bunker complex, and it had you know triple standard concertina, and uh, we had a support by fire position. So we had all our machine guns up there, and had a couple of attached Jordanian machine guns that were up there. And I had my gun squad sergeants that were running all of this. And it was just a platoon exercise. So I'm moving with the platoon leader, whose father actually, when I was at the remote viewing unit, his father took command of the DIA. Owens, Kevin Owens was the platoon leader. And I'm, uh, Kevin was my weapons platoon leader and I just made him uh, a rifle platoon leader. And so I'm moving with this platoon, evaluate, see what's happening, make sure we don't do anything stupid. And uh, I, I can remember the, we had breached the obstacles and we're getting ready to go to the, you know, you attack a bunker complex by grabbing the back bunker on one end of the objective and then you roll up the long axis of the objective that's how you take out bunker complexes because they're in a, a what's called a lazy w and the back bunkers cover the front bunkers and then the front bunkers have interlocking fields of fire as well so <clears throat> you can't go to the front bunker first you have to kill the back bunker first mm. and then the next back bunker and then you can get the front bunker and then etc so you split assault elements and systematically go after this and there's a process a technique for doing that and the first thing you have to do is there's a visual signal and a verbal signal on the radio, but the visual signal is a shift fire. It's not the shift fire is not lift fire. Lift fire means stop firing. Lift, lift your fires off of the objective, but a shift fire means to shift from that back bunker because every gun has one or two bunkers. They don't just sweep back and forth. Every gun, machine gun, has bunkers that it's responsible for. So that gun is, is, is hammering those bunkers. And our M60 machine guns, I mean, now the, the M249s and others are even better. You know, they, they, can, they can eat the roof off of, a, off of a bunker to the point that it just caves in on people. They're amazingly powerful weapons. Wow. And you're just firing this huge volume of rounds into these bunkers and the i remember the yellow smoke came out which was the visual signal to shift so you're supposed to shift the fire all the guns shift to the right a, a bunker and the guys that were on the far left were two jordanian machine guns but they're on traversing mechanisms traversing elevation mechanisms which kind of locks the gunner into all he can do is loosen it and slide it and slide it and slide it to take the barrel in a different direction, just slightly mm -hmm. or wildly. And in this particular case, the far the gunner to his right, another Jordanian, when the yellow smoke came out, shifted as he was supposed to to the right. And then the other gunner, and for reasons at that point, which were undetermined, there was speculation that he wanted to kill Americans. Uh, I don't know that that was correct. He might have just been stupid. You know, I, I don't know. But he unlocked his t and &E mechanism, freed the gun and swept it, you know, pushed the butt of the, of the machine gun to the right, pushing the barrel to the left. And he emptied uh, about... 100 125 rounds of grazing fire uh grazing fire means like one meter above the ground uh grazing fire 120 150 rounds swept it back and forth through the assault element of americans <clears throat> and could have killed a, a dozen or more easily and didn't kill any of them and I was squatting with the platoon leader. I was just squatting down and watching him. I saw the smoke go out and I just remember looking at the back of his hand. And to this day, I could just remember the camouflage paint on the back of his hand. And he was keying the mic, giving the verbal signal for shift fires. And at that point, I was hit in the head, in the helmet actually, my Kevlar helmet by a 7.62 
U.S. machine gun round traveling roughly 2,830 some odd feet per second. So, you know, the kinetic energy of that is significant because it was not a ricochet. It was a direct hit into the helmet and it didn't ricochet off my helmet. It hit my helmet about, about three inches above my right eye and it hit into the helmet and was caught by the Kevlar. It didn't go through the Kevlar. It didn't hit it dead on, it hit it like this and so it got caught, the bullet did. So it kind of like grazed your helmet. <laughs> No, it, it, the helmet caught it. It, it came went, directly in like this. It, it came up here. So there was a curvature of the oh, helmet. Oh, I see. I but see. But it didn't skip off. It, right. The helmet just, it penetrated the layers of the Kevlar and it, the Kevlar just caught it like that. But that speed and that kinetic energy, it kind of, I mean, I, it, it took me off my feet. I mean, not like five feet like you see in the movies but it took me off my feet and knocked me out and i was unconscious and during the time that i was unconscious um i felt like i had some sort of a a vision or or an out-of-body experience or something and and that is not something you know to this day that i would turn around and present it to anybody as fact i can just tell you that was my experience I don't know where that came from or why that was there, but that experience and that trauma, that kinetic energy, I had what you know would now be called a closed head injury. In those days, that wasn't in the lexicon of medicine, a closed head injury from you know something like that. I had a big hematoma on my head, and uh, you know they flew me away and to uh, Amman and had a uh, an X-ray done, but. You know, there was no nothing pressing on the brain, et cetera. They brought me back. I couldn't put my helmet on because uh, my head had swollen too much. I couldn't put my helmet back on again. But hey, you're a Ranger Company commander. And one thing that's really clear is in the Rangers, if you are injured, like if you're injured, they will take you out of that command and put somebody in that command that fast. Because why? Because your X number of hours wheels up to go wherever the Republic sends you. So it's a very competitive environment. And you can either make the decision to let that happen or make the decision to say, I'm okay. Put me back in, coach. I can, I can do it. So I stayed there. Wow. But when I got back uh, and finally turned over that company, I had been having these episodes of what I thought were like out of body experiences. I mean, I had no reference for that. I had n no understanding of it. It wasn't in my lexicon. But because these things kept happening, I was going to the library and looking this stuff up and reading more about it and things. And when I finally turned over my ranger company, uh, <clears throat> months, months later, uh, I was recruited into my first. Uh, special access program. So the first special access program was uh, at that time codenamed Royal Cape. Uh, it's also called the activity. Uh, it's also called uh, the Secret Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, there's a book written called uh, Killer Elite. And uh, the first one talks exactly about that unit and what that unit was about. And I was the deputy XO, executive officer, the deputy 2IC there, second in command. Uh, there were two full colonels in command, one infantry guy, one intel guy. Uh, heavy, heavy as a bunch of special forces guys in there. But you were also required it, when you were there to get polygraphed every quarter. <clears throat> a CI poly, not a full lifestyle poly. Uh, CI poly is counterintelligence poly, which is... They're going to hook you up at a polygraph machine and uh, the polygraphers who work for the unit are going to ask you questions. Have you ever divulged classified inf information? Do you know anybody who has? Have you ever wrongfully taken classified information? Blah, 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 right? There's like a series of 10 questions. <clears throat> and after you pass your poly, you then go in to meet with the command psychologist. So they actually, in this unit, 
had a command psychologist, a lieutenant colonel psychologist. Why? Because they needed somebody from the, uh, like a mental health professional to keep their finger on the psychiatric pulse of the organization. Because in an organization like that, where you're living a double life, where you're telling lies for a living and it takes a toll and it takes a big toll. And a lot of these guys were on their fifth and sixth marriages. Uh, I mean, it was the only place I've ever seen a lieutenant colonel who was married, a lieutenant colonel, special forces infantry officer, get in a fist fight with a command sergeant major who was also married over a redheaded female E4 who they were both, you know, intimate with. I mean... Me, my driver, and some other guy, we're out there pulling these guys apart, out fighting. I've never seen that anywhere before, but I saw it there. Wow. It was a crazy, crazy place. But sitting down with that psychologist, uh, the second time, the second quarter I was there, that was where I shared with him because he always had this last question. He would say, is there anything you would like to share? Which I always thought was fucking creepy because it was like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Open-ended. Yeah, like, what do, what do you know that I don't know that you know? Those things. And uh, the second time I was in there with him, I said, yeah, actually, there is. I had this thing happen. Started in Jordan. It's happened like three, four, five times since then. And I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why it's happening. He did, I thought he might, you know, pick up the phone and call Walter Reed or something, you know, and uh, send me over to be evaluated and then somebody was going to give me some psychotropic uh, medications to, you know, harness my brain or something. I had no idea. I just wanted to know if he knew what to do or what could be done because I really was uncomfortable with it. I mean, I, I didn't like it, right, because I, I didn't understand it. And... The day I said that to him, uh, he started handing me secret and top secret documents and telling me to read them and that we would talk about them in the morning. And those documents were about the remote viewing unit and things that the remote viewing unit had done. And that was my limited read on. He, he didn't, I didn't know it was remote viewing. That was not on the documents. It doesn't say that. It just gave the name of the organization. But the things you were looking at and reading, it was not difficult to discern that these are, this is somebody describing something that it, they are not physically located with this, right? And the very first night, and I'll just say that and for, so you can ask the next question, is the very first night, one of the things I'm looking at, I, there are two people. One, they're both referred to as by numbers, not names. And they're both obviously physically co-located because they're verbalizing with each other. This is recorded transcript, right? Okay. But one is steering the other and the other is describing things that are not in their physical location. And one says to one, you know, are you outside the building where you're supposed to be? <clears throat> the other says, yes, I believe I am. And the other then says, great, good. Okay, now pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. That was my first introduction to remote viewing. Pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. In a, in a top secret document, sitting in a secret compartmented information facility, reading that transcript about a special access program while I was already in another special access program. And I was already on the Department of the Army special access roster, which means when you go do that, they take your file and they send it to Dasser. And you're now no longer, if somebody was to type your, your social security number into the big giant Army computer, it would say service member not on file. So I was already removed one level into the Dasser and I'm reading this, and I, I mean, what would you think? 
So I mean, I was. You're a part of some black program. That's what a special access program is. Okay. Yeah. Now you described these crazy out of body experiences you started having after you got shot in the head. Can you describe what those experiences were like? Well, they're dreamlike, uh, but at the same time, very, very lucid. I mean, uh, I mean, I can give you an example. I, you know, like one time in the remote viewing unit, I was being trained in extended remote viewing, which is completely different than coordinate remote viewing. It's a different protocol. But I remember, <clears throat> you know, taking the coordinates and trying to go into this altered state. You're supposed to go to a theta brainwave state, alpha brainwave state for coordinate remote viewing, theta brainwave state for extended remote viewing, deeper, you know, almost to the edge of sleep in delta, right? Uh, and I remember getting up out of the, we had, they had, a bed that you would lay in or, or on uh, to do the extended remote viewing. I remember getting up. Uh, the red light in the room that normally illuminated the room was off. And I remember going to the door and it was like being in a twilight. Everything was like a gray. And I go to the door and I open the door and there were no lights on in the building. The whole building was just dark and absent there was nothing there and i remember going down the hallway and opening the front door to the remote viewing building and going outside and i remember looking up and it was like i was standing in an eclipse that's how the the whole mat uh tone of the world looked at that point and i walked down off the steps these wooden steps and out into this little asphalt kind of parking lot between the two buildings the admin building in front of me, the remote viewing building behind me. And I remember looking up into the sky and then as just as if I thought about it, shooting straight up into the sky, like a thousand feet straight up into the sky. And then realizing that whatever momentum brought me up to that point had now exhausted and I was now falling backwards back to earth and then I woke up and I was in the remote viewing room. So all of that was like an out of body experience. That's wow. how I can describe it for you. Yeah, and those happened a lot. It was always up in the air, looking down at things. Uh, the tone and the texture of things was crisp and sharp, but the tone was always this and you monotone, were, right? You were conscious, like you were aware of what was going on. You were lucid. This no. Wasn't, this wasn't like a, okay, so it was more like a dream. Like a dream, but I've never had a dream like that before or since. I've not had a dream like that. Dreams are considerably different. I mean, it, it, it when you've had that kind of an experience, you, it, there's a, there's a crispness to it mm -hmm. where dreams seem to be more muddled and right, you know right. convoluted and i mean you know right. it, it's like it's almost like changing channels in a dream you're here and that and then this right. and that right and in this it was it was very linear but very crisp and organized and was very aware of what was happening like when I looked into the hallway and there were no lights on in the building, I realized that there was, that was unusual that there were no lights in the building. Uh, when I walked out under the porch and I felt like the, the light is wrong, where's the sun? It's like standing in an eclipse. Uh, I remember thinking that. And then I remember standing out, walking out into the asphalt and then saying, well, let me see if I can jump upwards and maybe see if I can go up and, and for whatever stupid reason, right? Your brain thinks this and then mm -hmm. you find yourself shooting straight up into the air and then it, you, you gas out and then you're at this place of going, oh, well, holy shit, now I'm going to fall backwards again. And it, it's very real to you at that point. But you asked me what that feels like. That's what it felt like. And it, it happened many, many times before I got there. And it happened... Uh, many times after that, they don't happen anymore. And I do dream, but I 
don't have any experiences like that. But you were deliberately trying to have those experiences. No. Oh, I, you I actually weren't. wasn't. No, no, not at all. No. Okay. So after you got into this, got initiated into this black secret access, special access program, and you read the documents, what did they have you do next? Mm. Well, <clears throat> you have to understand in special access programs, they're, the process by which you are brought into those programs is what's called a limited read-on process. <clears throat> in other words, they don't just go grab you and say, hey, Danny, you know, we really like you to come work for us in this SAP that we've got over here. And you would say, well, great, you know, what are you doing there? Well, here it is, you know, and they lay it out what they do. Right, right. And then you go like, right. And then you go like, well, fuck that. I don't want to go do that. <laughs> right. And they go, well, are you sure? Because, you know, come on, man. I just told you everything that we're doing. And you're like, no, nah, fuck you. I'm not going to do that. And that that's why they don't do that. So what they do is they incrementally they give you a little bit a little bit and they keep testing the water they keep poking you and asking questions it's a process and i didn't know what that process was because i'm not an intel officer i'm a i'm a combat arms right you know right. special operations <laughs> infantryman you know affiliated with the ranger regiment that's my regimental affiliation so i had no idea what they were doing but and now i know what they were doing it was a limited read on it was you know, just feed me a little, see what I did, what I said, what I thought, you know, was I balking or what was I expressing interest? So six, seven months down the road, I get brought to the remote viewing unit, which is at Fort Meade, Maryland at that time. And I come with the psychologist <clears throat> who knocks on the door. It's just, first of all, you, you come walking up to the building and it's, uh, it's like the most fucked up thing I'd ever seen. I mean, it, I mean, really, it was like horrible. I mean, it was a World War II Baker's school and the building to the right, which was the remote viewing unit, that was a barracks bay, which they then put other walls up in for a remote viewing unit. The, the shingles on the top were these green asphalt shingles that are all cupped up like baloney, you know, on a hot skillet. <laughs> The paint was peeling off everything. It was like it, this were literally World War II buildings. Wow. Right? <clears throat> and they just look like, in fact, it, I later found out that they had been, like five years earlier, had been marked for destruction. Mm -hmm. Like they were just going to, you know, burn them in place or tear them down and haul them to the dump or something. But we were there. And there's a great big security door, big giant metal security door in the front with a combination lock on it and this uh phd psychologist you know raps on the door they open it up and they welcomed him like he was there every day you know <clears throat> he came in me in tow and he brought me <clears throat> he goes i'm gonna go meet with uh mr gavin fern gavin who was the program manager the gs15 guy in charge of the unit at that time there had been others before him and after him. And I am then taken to meet all of the, all this cast of characters that's in the unit. And my first, the first guy I meet is Mel Riley. <clears throat> and Mel is in the farthest back room, which is considered the smoking room. So Mel and there are two women, Robin and Angela, and Robin and Angela are sitting, they're everybody sitting at gray metal army desks. But Robin and Angela have black tablecloths spread over their desks. And they're, they're doing whatever it is you do with tarot cards. There are tarot cards on their desk, which I just looked at that and thought, well, that's sure shit, not something you see every day in a military organization. <laughs> and not to mention when I first walked in, I look across the, what they called the lobby, which was like 20 feet away. There's this giant, as big as where you have all this sound uh, foam here. Mm -hmm. It's a mural, a, a mural, a black mural of a galaxy. 
painted on the wall. And I'm thinking, that's not something you see every day in a military. You go into a military organization and they have like weapons and, you know, whatever it is they do. If they're armor, it's tanks and artillery. They have artillery pieces, infantry. Mm -hmm. It's got infantry guys. You know, it's uh, it was weird to see that. Cause have you ever seen that show called Stranger Things on Netflix? <clears throat> No. Oh, okay. That's what I'm thinking of when you're describing this. It was just really weird. I mean, like the hair went up on the back of my neck and and seeing the tarot card things. I mean, I knew what tarot cards were. I just didn't know what the fuck they were doing with them there and why why you would be doing it. Right. And and, and I look at Mel and Mel's got a he has a an elk hide fur on one side and it's flipped over and he is there's a an elaborate, you know, array of beads in these segmented little places and he's got a a needle that's not much thicker than a human hair it looks like and he's pulling up one little glass bead at a time and he's selling these beads onto this brain tanned they use the elk's brains to tan the hide which makes it softer and more supple Mel told me that later. He's he's sewing beads onto it in this intricate pattern because that's that was his hobby, that was his love. He was he had mastered this Native American craft of beadwork and breastplates and headgear wow. and stuff like that. His stuff is he passed away now, but his stuff is in museums. Oh wow. You know? He was so, and, and he was invited back to a number of Native American. Uh, I know they don't like the word tribe, but back to the, a number of Native American uh, groups to teach them the the art, the lost art of this craft that they, you know, have let go by the wayside because their their kids don't want to know it. But right. he teaches it to them now. So, and did it for decades before passing away of, of uh, lung cancer. So I see that Mel, you know, that's Mel. He has dream drums and tomahawks and lances and skins and everything mm. else there. I mean, again, you're thinking, well, shit, that's not something you see every day, you know? And then I meet Mel Riley, Gabrielle Pettengill, Paul Smith, <laughs> Ed Dames. I mean, all of them, they're all there. And that that's the group of people that, I ended up uh, working with, but I, after beating them all, then I'm brought in to meet Fern Gavin. Who's Fern Gavin? Fern is the program manager. Okay. Just 15. Okay. He had replaced a Lieutenant Colonel who had that position and Fern takes me in and the psychologist steps out <clears throat> and Fern says, have a seat. He goes, you know, let me lead off here. I'm always impressed that there are young officers willing to give everything up to come be part of this organization. <laughs> now, those were not words that I understood because I wasn't willing to give anything up and I was going to be a general someday. So what are you talking about? I said, I don't even know what you do here. Right. You know, I read some stuff, and but I don't know what you do. And he looks at me and he goes, well, what we do here uh, is... We train people to enter <coughs> my throat. <coughs> Sorry. What we do here is we train people to enter an altered state of consciousness. <coughs> oh God. That liquid death, no joke. <laughs> no, it's it's <coughs> Florida doesn't agree with me, but oh, yeah. we train people here to enter into an altered state of consciousness to transcend space and time, to view persons, places, or things remote in space and time, and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. And we would like you to be one of us. Yeah, that was what he said. And I, you know, from a physics perspective, some of that's true, others not true, but the whole idea behind it, that's what he said. And that's a whole nother, you know, story. But mm -hmm. I I didn't agree. I mean, I was like, I, I need to think about that. I okay. I mean that's 
I really need to think about that. And uh, so I went back. I talked to my wife and uh, at the time and said, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. She thought, of course, that I was that I had a screw loose. She knew what I had gone through. And when we got back to uh, Royal Cape, to the activity, uh, also called ISA, we got back there. <clears throat> uh, the commander, who was Colonel Tony Lackey, he was extraordinarily pissed. He was more pissed at the psychologist than he was at me. <clears throat> but I ran to work every day with, with uh, Colonel Lackey. And so, like, for the next two weeks, he just bitched at me and told me about why I shouldn't go to this unit, why it was just nothing but it was nothing but a place of misfits and freaks and that if I went there to go do that, that I would never recover from it, <laughs> you know, that I would be, my, my career would be stained, it would be it, you know, mm -hmm. nothing good has ever come out of there, you'll never be able to shake that off. And, and I really thought about it and thought about it, but then there was just something inside of me that was intrigued by it. And I don't know, maybe I was just at that point in my career where I was, <clears throat> I was now in this special access program you know, the activity and doing what I was doing there, I was uh, I was a guy that briefed John O. Marsh Jr., the Secretary of the Army at the time, <clears throat> on all of the movement. Every, every time somebody in that organization did something, like if they were going to send them to jump school or they were going to send them, uh, I don't care, wherever they were going to send them, for whatever reason, uh, it required a signature by the chief staff of the army, John O'Marsh Jr. So I was a guy that by the time every request to move somebody, somebody went through 54 staff inboxes to be approved and then to the secretary of the army for a final signature. Wow. I was the guy doing that and I fucking hated it. And I mean, it was great, you know, chatting with the secretary of the army three, four times a week, but I still, I mean, one of the code names was a guy by the name of Grape Goddess. I can still remember that there was a code name for this guy, Grape Goddess. And Grape Goddess needed to be moved from this country to another country <laughs> or from this, you know, from this city to that city, you know, back for, you know, to, to visit for a leave with the family and stuff. So to bring, uh, if you guys really want to know what they did, you know, in that role, read that book, you know, Killer Elite. That'll tell you better. I, I mean, the easy answer is that they were, they were there to uh, support and develop support structures to, uh, to support clandestine and covert military operations in Tier 1 and Tier 2 countries. Okay. Okay? That's the unclassified version of that, but that's what they were there to do. So you had guys that were... They were. They had covers. They had code names, and they were there doing that. And they could have been doing something like <clears throat> making sure that they were able to get somebody witting from Coca Cola <laughs> Bottling Company in Brazil, shall we say, uh, to set up a number of safe houses, uh, or some trucking company to be, you know, to have trucks on call if they needed them or other safe houses in other places. It, wow. It's that kind of thing. Okay. So that's your job. You go there to do that shit. This organization also, here's another big shattering thing I haven't talked about in a long time. <clears throat> and I found this out. Now, Sean probably didn't tell you, but I'm LDS. I'm not, not practicing, but I, I graduated from Brigham Young University. That's where I did my undergraduate work. Uh, I was a high priest in the Mormon church. <clears throat> uh, served in a stake presidency and in a in a uh, uh, a bishopric as as a second counselor, and I see this I see this operation that I'm now going to brief the Secretary of the Army on that we're sending like five five guys five five soldiers who are not LDS by the way they're not Mormons. And we're sending them to the language training to the missionary training center <clears throat> in Provo, Utah, and then to the language training center in Provo, Utah, to learn to speak a language. And then we're sending them into the field 
as Mormon missionaries to spy, you know, on the populace to collect, to also establish relationships with church members there that could support clandestine and covert military operations. And I went to the lieutenant colonel that had headed this program back in the back of the building, you know, in another skiff. So you're in a skiff, you go to another skiff. And I go in there and I said, is this for real? And he goes, of course it's for real. I go, and the church knows this? I mean, they know because I remember at BYU, returned missionaries would always say, yeah, it was really tough down in Central and South America because... Everybody would point at us and go, oh, you're CIA kind of things. And I just thought, well, that's ridiculous. You know, why would they think that? You're walking around in a suit and a tie or short sleeves with a tie on and you've got your badge on elder so-and-so, right? And you're doing that. Why would they think you were CIA? Well, now the, I fucking know. Wow. <laughs> so that's bizarre, isn't man. It? And now I have, I have uh, on occasion, you know, given talks at different places around obviously around the world and i did one in cedar city utah years ago years ago god back in the 90s and there there were like 180 people in this place and i told that story and i and i expressed frustration that that i always took really great pride in the fact that that church uh didn't take any money from the federal government you know uh, whenever the federal government, you know, or the state government, state government might have come to them and said, well, if you don't do such and such, or if you try to do such and such, we're going to withhold our, you know, the, the money that we give you. And the church was always very clear coming back going, you don't give us any money and we don't accept any money from you. So you can't make us do that uh, if it was against the doctrine of the church. Like at BYU, it was a... <clears throat> They didn't have co-ed uh, residences, co-ed dorms, stuff like that. Right. You, you were either, like if you had an apartment complex, it was either a male apartment complex or a female apartment complex. Mm. You could not put the two together in those days, back in the 70s. And so <laughs> there was a whole big stink because the church went and they put these apartment complexes off limits. If they catch them doing, you know, trying to integrate them they they would put them off limits which meant that students could not reside there you'd have to find another place because it was now banned <clears throat> and if you wanted to go to BYU you had to live by that code of conduct and adhere to what you know the church or the school had said it about that so the the apartment owners were up in arms and they were trying to turn this into the giant lawsuit and they were going to sue the you know brigham young university they were going to sue the church and they went after trying to do that but it was huge in the newspapers back at the time so right around the time they shot gary gilmore and <laughs> is that gary gilmore was a murderer that was convicted who in utah in the utah state prison asked to be executed by firing squad oh yeah i've never heard of it since and i had never heard of it before then but gary gilmore yeah they executed him at utah state prison by firing squad wow. at his request right around that time <clears throat> all this shit's going on and i just remember you know you're reading in the paper because it's like the president of the university was dallin oaks and uh i can't believe i remember that stuff but you know yeah the the federal government was going well y you can't you can't do that to these apartment owners. You can't put these kinds of decrees upon uh, people and say that students can't live here or live there. And they went, yeah, we can. And like, no, you can't. Like, yeah, we can. And it was like, no, you can't. Or we're going to withhold all of our funding to you. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't take any of your funding. So, you know, without, wow. without saying that, they were basically saying, go fuck yourself. You right. Because, you know, you, we don't take any of your funding mm. at all, period. <clears throat> you don't, mm -hmm. none of these students are federally funded in any way, and we're not federally funded. So, yeah, we will do that. Did you hear about that story about that huge Mormon community that was down in Mexico that was killing cartel members? Mm -hmm. They were like super, like very heavily armed. I think like, people <laughs> got in there and saw that they these guys had like <clears throat> ungodly amounts of weapons and ammunition. 
and they were like hunting down the cartels. Yeah. That you know who they were related to, right? No, the guy was a presidential candidate. Um, yeah, you know, dark-haired, handsome guy. What the fuck is his name? I. <clears throat> his family comes from. That's where he came from. There, they. A, a presidential candidate of Mexico? <clears throat> no, presidential candidate in the United States. Oh. Uh, God dang it! I, now, now that we're mentioning it, I yeah, gotta, look. At, yeah, we can look it up. <clears throat> we gotta, we gotta look this up because, yeah, that's what that is from. He. Romney, Mitt Romney. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Romney is a, uh, he's LDS. And his family, uh, his family kind of originates in the Arizona area, but then they're, they went into Mexico and started this agricultural uh, work in Mexico. And th that is his family, oh, or extensions shit. of his family wow. down there. Yeah, big extensions. I mean, like, they're they're related and uh they actually yeah they are down there and then the cartels were you know transiting back and forth and were threatening workers and other stuff so they just went like yeah well fuck it <laughs> you know Jeez. that's just uh you know you got ak's we can buy ak's <laughs> yeah you got rpk's we can buy rpk's you know you want RPGs? We can buy them too. You know, we have money and they were buying it. So they, they geared up and it was just that way. It was like, if you, if you want to fight, we'll fight. And that's insane. Yeah. I mean, you know, but yeah, people don't realize that that's one of the places that his family, you know, migrated across the border. There are pieces of his family that are in there that mm. were part of that. So I know that wow. story. Yeah. Okay. So, so. Once you started, I, I take it you made the decision to go ahead and be a part of this program. Against right? everyone I know's Against wishes. Against everyone's yeah. wishes. Everyone's wishes. Yeah. So what did they train you in? How, what was the <laughs> protocol of doing? I guess this back, gets back to my original question like about yeah. an hour and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does this whole thing work and how does the information come to you when you are remote viewing? How do you remote view? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, being a trainer, <clears throat> I was just fucking appalled that when I got there, it was like, you know, I'm 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 I sitting down for my first lecture. Well, the the first this is the first thing that they do is they bring you into the safe room. There's, and I don't mean safe like protective room. It's a it's a room filled with safes, <clears throat> and they're they're these uh, file drawer safes. They're like four four drawers high. They're like 32 inches deep, 24 inches wide combination. You spin the combination, you open up the safe and you can pull out the drawers. Well, there's one on the far right that's the historical safe. <clears throat> and they said, okay, so uh, before you get your first lecture, you go to this safe every morning and you start at this file, top drawer, front. And when you get to the last file in the bottom drawer in the back, then tell me and we'll start your training. So I'm like, fuck. Because now you're just like, you know, <clears throat> it's like, God darn, man, that's a shit. So it took me weeks to wallow through it. And I saw things that were really <clears throat> strange and <clears throat> strange and interesting. And at, at the same time, things you just look at yourself, you know, in the mirror in the morning and go like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, is this for real? I mean, you drive to work there going, I can't fucking believe what I'm doing. You know, I, I can't believe I, you know, I'm an army major getting paid to, yeah, this is the strangest thing I could ever know, you know, to like, I mean, I'll believe anything now, you know I mean? It's like anything in the Intel world you tell me about, uh, yeah, I, okay, I, I'll, I'll believe it. Cause no matter look how sci-fi it is. Yeah. yeah I mean, look at where I am and what I'm doing and going to work to do. And right. so after you get done with the historical file, which is the story of everything leading up to the unit, <clears throat> everything that the Soviets were doing, everything the Chinese were doing, everything the Israelis were doing, everything that anybody else, the Germans, the Brits, I mean, anybody that was dabbling in this and they were all dabbling in it. Why? Because it was cheap. 
Mm. And it, it's like the director of the Central Intelligence Agency said back in 73, he goes, All right, fuck, I don't care if it's only 3% accurate, if it, or rather 6% accurate. If it's 6% accurate information that I cannot glean by any other intelligence collection means, it's intelligence dollars well spent. I mean, it's 6% of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Now, it's far more accurate than 6%. Uh, 6% would be very low, actually, but... You get what I'm saying to you, yes, right? He yes. was like, fuck it. You know, this is stupid. If we can get a bunch of people in a room and teach them how to go into an altered state of consciousness and they come back and with sketches and verbal, right. you know, sensory data about something, like, yeah, fuck yeah, you know, right. this is good. Let's do right. this. <clears throat> so that's where I saw all of that. And then I sat down for my first day of training. And the first guy that steps in front of me is Ed Dames. <clears throat> who's a smart fucking guy. I mean, he's smart. Speaks Mandarin Chinese. Wow. Reads, write, and speaks Mandarin Chinese. Reads, writes, and speaks Vietnamese. Whoa. <clears throat> he's the closest thing to a physicist or a scientist that that place ever saw, okay? Uh, next to me. And, and he's standing in front of me and I go, <clears throat> Uh, all I have here is a, a pad and a pen. I go, is there a training outline? He goes, no. I said, is there a, a, a program of instruction? No. Is there a fucking manual, you know, for this? Like, can I read ahead to understand? He goes, no. He goes, well, you know, there's some, you know, there's some shitty thing that's like 12 or 20 pages long, but we don't give it to anybody because it's a piece of shit. And I went, this is really not good. I mean, this is really not good. I mean, I'm an academic. I think and he is an academic and I'm like, okay, shoot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just, so every, you know, he was my, he was an instructor for some things. Mel Riley was an instructor for some things. And Gabrielle Pettengill was my primary instructor for pretty much everything. <clears throat> and it was like, whatever came to mind, that day for that period of instruction is what you were being taught. And for me, that was just like a catastrophic sin, you know, of military training or as an educator, you know, mm. you, are you kidding me? You know? Mm. So it made it very difficult for somebody like me who wanted to see the protocol, who wanted to understand the dogma, but, and then <clears throat> they kept talking about things like, an alpha brainwave state or a theta brainwave state. And I was like, I'd raise my hand like, but how do you get there? Well, you know, it, it, it's like this. And they would tell you like how you're supposed to feel when you get there. I go, but that's not, that's not how to get there. And that's not proof. I mean, you're, you're telling me how I'm supposed to interpret a physiological response to being in a brainwave state. And you're telling me that because that's what somebody told you and somebody told the person that told you got told by somebody else, but you're not giving me any, any actual em, em, empiric evidence of how to get there. You're not telling me. So you're saying it's like all objective experiences it, it, being subjective. So, that's, that's what I meant. Subjective. subjective. Yeah. yeah. It's all, it, it, it's, yeah, well, when you get to an alpha brainwave state, you'll feel this. Okay. Well, fuck that. You know, right. that, that that doesn't mean anything to me. Right. I mean, I, that, I understand what you're doing, but no, there has to be a way to get there and you have to measure and know you're there. I can't know that I'm there based on what you're telling me. That none of it made, none of it connected. None of it made sense. It was sloppily done and uh, <clears throat> disappointing. And uh, still you, you learned how to do it, but it, it was just, trashily it was trashy done you know it was really not a good thing and there was not a manual the entire time i was there so i was asked to write the manual last 90 days i was there and i wrote a manual it was like 250 pages long but i know what happened to it i mean once i gave that to fern gavin i mean shortly after i left he was displaced by you know another guy by the name of dale and dale came in there and i know that all the old school guys that were there just went like yeah well fuck we're not going to take this 
the Morehouse is only here for three years, and you know we're not going to use a manual he developed. I mean, to hell with that. You know, we've been here forever, and they had. I mean, there are guys still alive today that have been there for 15 years. I mean, can you imagine 15 years out of a 20 year career no. to be in that place? Hell no. Yeah. I, I mean, I never had any intention of going to that place and being there like that. I was there to check a box to get what I could get from the organization. Uh, it was my second special access program at that point. And, you know, I went off to another special access program before going to command a general staff college. And that's a whole nother story, but, um, this, the, the third special access program, but yeah, I, it was, it was just shoddy, but despite that, you, you could sit there as a scientist or as an academic and you could question things and they didn't have good answers for them. They just kept telling you, push on, you know, push on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're going to get to the point where those questions are going to be invalid. And it just what they were saying is that there's this crossover point just through the act of doing it that you're going to get to a place where the volume <clears throat> of verbal and visual data exceeds your ability to explain it away when you're given the feedback. You're not going to be able to look at the feedback and go, well, I could have just made that shit up because it's going to be 20 pages of verbal and visual data, textural sketches, contour sketches, dimensional sketches, uh, geospatial sketches, <clears throat> colors, temperatures, textures, tastes, sounds, smells, right? Uh, emotionals, uh, intangibles, aesthetics, all these levels of data that you're going to start producing based on each stage that you move through, stage one, two, three, four, five, all the way out to six. By the time you get into stage three <clears throat> in your training, that's the you know, that's where you're now like uh, pushing up to three months of training. And at that point, the, vo the sheer volume of what you're doing and the picture that you're able to paint based on just two sets of four numbers, when they give you the feedback, you have to, first of all, finish it all, finish your se session. Mm -hmm. You have to do a session summary. You have to reference your sketches and all these other things. And so you pull together the summary and then you hand that in and it's evaluated. It's evaluated by your trainer, by your trainers, and by the program manager. And <clears throat> only after they are looking and evaluating your structure, the structure is all they give a shit about at that point, only the structure. So that you understand in stage one, you do these things. Stage two, you do these things. Stage three, you do these things four, five, it's it, right? So that's what they're looking at. If there are violations in the structure, they don't give a shit about your content, but if there were violation, violations in the structure, <clears throat> they, would, they would give you your feedback or they would give you your feedback with counseling. In other words, you failed to do this, you failed to do that. Now you're gonna go, you have another training target this afternoon, right? Okay or tomorrow morning. So they would push you back in again and they wouldn't push you up another level. They would make you, you would do another stage three target or another stage two target, they call it. Okay. Until you demonstrated that you had mastered a stage two or stage three or four, right? All the way to six. And that's how they did that, uh, which was, I get it. You know, it's like, uh, I guess in wrestling, you know, uh, you, you learn a move and your coach requires you to do it until you master that move. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't, then you either he does something different or, you know, he keeps you working on it until you master the move. So that was the idea there. Okay. And I understood that. And, <clears throat> but by the time you're into stage three and into it, the sheer volume of the data that you're producing, the story you're writing in the in the session summary, and then they would hand you the feedback. The feedback in those days really sucked. It was like, 
you know, a Xerox copy of a Xerox copy of a Xerox copy, so mostly black and then some, you know, some textual descriptions of what you're looking at. So they're really horrible. Nowadays, we do video. Right. And we do put all kinds of links in it where you can right. go to this place and look at it. But you get this Xerox copy of something with this, you know, thing written. Nowadays, we put uh, quantifiable attributes about the target. So in other words, you should, these things should be perceivable. And it could be like up to two, it could be 200 quantifiable attributes. So you're now looking at your session and your session summary, and you're looking at the quantifiable attributes and the feedback, and you're establishing a statistical rating for yourself by going, I got that, yep, I got that, I didn't get that, I got that, I got that, Okay. Didn't get this, didn't get that, but I got that, I got that, right? You go all the way through it because these quantifiable, known quantifiable attributes that pertain to this particular complex gestalt of a target. What were you explaining with the two <coughs> sets of numbers? <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> the way this process works, again, theoretical, okay, is that we understand that everything in the world, everything in this environment, at the quantum level, the table in front of us right now, everything, that it's, it appears to us as a wooden table or as a computer or a microphone, all these things. It appears to us as that because it is a concentration of, of molecules, of Right, atoms, Mo atoms, yeah. and molecules right. that create for us this thing that is agreed upon for us as being an object, right? But at the quantum level, these things are nothing but space. Mm -hmm. So you could take, if I were to ask you a simple thing like, how many atoms in an orange? You, would, in order to actually be able to, you know, to, to figuratively demonstrate that you'd have to blow the orange up to the size of planet earth so if you blew the orange up to the size of planet earth the atoms in that orange would be the size of grapes okay <clears throat> so if i pull one grape out of that and say okay uh can you find the nucleus and the electrons in in this atom for that to be demonstrable you would have to blow that grape up to the size of let's say the astrodome okay <laughs> so the grape now is the size of the, that's the atom and uh the the actual nucleus would be the size of a small pea a dried pea cast somewhere into the astrodome not here or there but anywhere and the electrons would be the size of grains of sand cast into the astrodome. Now you get the idea, right? That at the, at the quantum level, the subatomic level, what's between the P, the grains of sand, the astrodome, space. Now what's that space filled with? Now it goes into particle wave theory. <clears throat> the idea, you know, that we have that we get taught in school is that oh well you know it's it's the it's this uh, old Newtonian model where you see the you see the the nucleus and the, and they have the drawing of the the electrons moving around the nucleus and stuff well that's all bullshit it's not like that at all not not at all <clears throat> in particle wave theory you hear people mentioning they'll say well when it's observed it's a particle when it's unobserved and People don't understand what that means. When it's observed, it means it's when it's measured, okay? When it's actually being measured. Mm. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but to put it into just a lay language that we can adopt for this demonstration or this understanding, it, let's just say that, that from a field now, that space is filled with waveform because that's actually how it exists so when it is observed or measured that waveform of a particular particle now it coalesces into a particle 
and it's a position. So position one. And when it is no longer observed or no longer measured, it decoheres back into waveform. When it is measured again, it coalesces back again into a particle, and it's now position two. When it is no longer measured or observed, it decoheres back into waveform. If it is observed again, measured again, it coalesces back up now particle point three, right? So when you look at that, your conscious mind says, for those that don't understand that, they go, oh, well, it was in position one, now it's in position two, and then it went to position three. And so that particle went from the, the, the it went, it went the most direct path from position one to two and from position two to three by the most direct path. Quantum mechanical concepts say, no, no, it did not do that. What it did was when it, when it decohered back into wave form, it traveled by, and you got to hear this, every possible path. Every possible path. Which means that the waveform is omnipresent, omnidirectional. And if that waveform carried a signal, like a radio transmission, it would then be an omnip a source of omnipotent information from other any place. If, and that's what it is saying. Every possible path. Not the most direct path, every possible path. That means that that waveform, that's where these terms come of the holographic matrix field, right? The collective unconscious. The, it's everywhere all at once. It's everywhere all at once. Which means that if we are born with the inherent ability to do this, and these pieces were not put together back in the 70s with mm -hmm. SRI, but they are now. And that's what I teach. But if, that, if we're born with that ability, think about the grand plan that would have given humans that capability to be omniscient, omnipresent, omnidirectional, om, right? Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. It, and it, it gives an understanding of so many things in the world that we have before just gone like, well, what the fuck does that mean? I mean, how can you be everywhere at the same time? How can you be, right? right? How right. can you be? It's, it's a concept that is expressed and understood now from the quantum mechanical perspective. That's what that means. <clears throat> and it, it is tied to everything in quantum mechanical concepts, the, the particle wave and beyond. It's saying, that's why you're able to close your eyes, get into an altered state, and tap into something that you asked the question earlier that happened in 1942 or 1542 or 42, you know, AD or 42 BC or something like that. Can you do that? Yes, but that's going to be a whole nother lecture for you. But it, it is understandable and it is, it is teachable for that, that you can do that. It's understanding the moment. It's understanding patterns of potential. It's understanding uh, change distribution. It's, called, it's understanding probability distribution. It's understanding the equation of the moment. All of those things are pulled together and we we get it and we understand it now and what it is so how are you as a remote viewer able to tap into the waveform expression of something <clears throat> because it's not about you going so the whole transcend space and time thing i told you that that was not what it was you're not transcending space and time you're just going into an altered state of consciousness and you are detecting the waveform expression. <clears throat> and you are then at the speed of human thought decoding it into a four-dimensional language. So the detecting process happens in what is called eight-dimensional hyperspace. <clears throat> it is, it's a complex, it's, you can read up on it, but for us to talk about it would be four hours. So that's eight-dimensional hyperspace 
it's just saying that it's an omnidirectional, I mean, an, an omnipresent, uh, it's an omnipresent concept of showing the, how multiple dimensions are all interchanged and you can be in one and then you are in all eight at the same time. That's what that means, eight dimensional hyperspace. There's a lot been written on it. <clears throat> there are even GIFs out there that you can look out at, at a GIF and you can sh see by the gift and how the gift operates that you could, you can put yourself anywhere in the gift. And when you are put your mouse cursor there, what ends up happening is, as the gift, as the eight-dimensional hyperspace folds and moves, you're in every dimension of that eight-dimensional hyperspace. So essentially, what it's saying is, it's it's trying to give you an explanation, a scientific understanding of what we're saying when we're talking about omnipresence, right? Okay. So something in the future, something in the past, something in the present. It's not about transitioning space time. It is about just looking for that particular signal line is the term used for it, that particular signal line. And when you can tap into that particular signal line, it's an omnipresent waveform expression of something, right? And so in that waveform expression, it's like the reason the term, the holographic matrix field is used is because you have to understand what a hologram is. <clears throat> a hologram, when you're, when you're, first let's just talk about the waveform and then I'll, I'll go okay. to the hologram. It means that that waveform expression has all the information that you're looking for. All of the colors, textures, temperatures, tastes, sound, smells, aesthetics, <clears throat> dimensionals, intangibles, etc. Now, when you're saying this, when you're ex ex explaining what you're explaining right now, are you saying that everything is everywhere all at once? Is it, at the same time, there's multiple outcomes of the world or the universe all at once? Like, for example, say say the Nazis won World War II. Would there be an example of, like, right here, right now, like, that potential is also here? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's not what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, like that like that, like that, that movie or that, <laughs> that book that was, there was a film based off it, The Man, yeah. Man in the High Castle. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm, when you're given a, a target, coordinate uh you as a remote viewer don't have any idea what the target is going to be you don't have any idea only the person there's somebody else guiding it program manager program manager okay, okay. so the program manager going back to the unit the program manager gets a gets a target uh, a request for intelligence comes from a, a customer mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that that request for intelligence comes to the program manager. The program manager looks at that, sorts it out, figures out what kind of target it's going to be, knows which of the viewers are probably going to be better at this or which are not, or maybe he just doesn't give a shit and he's going to make everybody do it, right? Okay. But what he has to do now <clears throat> is he has to establish a concept for that target because it is his concept of that target that is going to be locked into those coordinates. It, some people re try to refer to it as an address. It's not really. It's a concept of the target. And why does that have to be there? Because <clears throat> if a concept of the target is not established, if there is no targeting question that helps to establish that target concept, it becomes like a shotgun blast of potentials and possibilities, right? Okay. <clears throat> so could be subject to an every imaginable kind of interpretation. So theoretically, the way that you distill that down is to is to establish a target concept, a target question. So client says, <clears throat> we want to know what happened at this time in this place on this day. He has to then write that down and lock that in so it's not just fleeting because it's called conceptual illusion if you don't do that. Conceptual illusion, it means that 
it's like if I try to ask you to hold the color purple in your head, you can't hold it because it starts to morph and drift. Right. It takes on different textures and different shades <laughs> and other things. That's conceptual illusion. Okay. It's one of the things that plagues us as human beings because it's like it's why we have extreme difficulty, you know, dealing with shit that's happened to us in the past, particularly if it if we deemed it traumatic. Mm. <clears throat> the truth of it is you'll never recall exactly what it was right, right right it's always elaborated and layered mm. and certain parts of it dropped other parts you know added other right. parts you know increased etc right mm -hmm. and we have a tendency just as part of our human animal makeup to 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 gravitate towards the negative i know there are always people that go oh, bullshit no i can do well, no true. you that's don't true. yeah <clears throat> yeah so if you ask if you ask 100 people to sit down and and list the 10 most significant things in their life 98% of those people if not all of them will make sure that at least 75% of the things that they list are negative fucking things hmm. they will not be like oh birth of the child of my child birth you know uh, graduation from high school it'll be no it, it'll be something different that you know it'll be the first time somebody called me this the first time i realized that i wasn't going to be arnold schwarzenegger the first time that i yeah. got an f the first time i got sexually assaulted the first time that's what happens okay <clears throat> so when when these things are when we're talking about trying to lock down this coordinate where when we say that in this event arc of time is a term that we use so an event arc of time is essentially saying okay you see the purple line there or the blue one yeah it says the target concept <clears throat> is the rms titanic at the exact moment it strikes ice at 11 40 p.m on that date <clears throat> so from that you can see it goes right down into the center right Mm -hmm. of uh the of that cartesian disc that you see there right right but then what we're saying and this is just an illustration there is an event arc of time that is actually above and below the whole event arc of time and it's saying that <clears throat> there are now things that are going to lead up to that and there are things that are going to imprint after that Okay. Okay. Right. So before that actual thing happens, the concept of the target strikes ice at 11.40 p.m. Things led up to that and things followed. Right. And all of those are perceivable because why? Because they are an imprint expressed as waveform because of the collective and the individual experience of those things okay okay <clears throat> now are they ever perfect and absolute and 100 percent? no because we already established that right mm -hmm. because individuals human beings have an inability to recall them perfectly so there's a collective understanding to it and there's an individual understanding or interpretation to it and both are individually and collectively morphing because of this concept of conceptual illusion. Still, there are things that we can know and things that we can go back and pull out, mm -hmm. things that we can see, re-examine, we can talk about them, we record them, we can sketch them, okay. we can say, right? So in this example, <clears throat> which is not necessarily a really good remote viewing example, it's just showing you that, you know, they're basically, all that shit you see on there is like seven different people. That's the thing that seven different people did that impacted all the rest of the people to, to put Titanic on the bottom of the ocean. Okay. Right? Okay. So you're looking at all these decisions. These are all little individual moments by individual people in there. And you're just seeing that for seven people, but it's showing you, look at all 
how it compounds and how all of this stuff happens. It all affects each thing in a moment in this event arc of time. So viewers have a target rich, right? Environment of waveform expression of things when they're going to look at something. Okay. You may be sending them to look at the Eiffel Tower. Okay. But there's based on the concept of that target, like it could be in present time. It could be the day that it was first opened. It could be the day that Adolf Hitler was standing on it, mm-hmm. you know, looking out over Paris. It could be anything. And if you looked at that, and that was that event was that blue line there. <clears throat> All these things would be happening along. So you don't many give this axes. to the viewer. <clears throat> no, you don't give any of this to the viewer. No, this is just for helping you understand okay, what it. we're talking about in terms of the concept of the time, a concept of the uh, event arc of time and right. you know all the things that are going on because people have a tendency to think of it simplistically like it's, oh, well, it's just that, but it's extraordinarily complex, right, the, of what's going on. And now think of the event arc of time there for those seven players in that one event. Now take the other... 1800 passengers and understand that every one of them has an has a, an event arc of time that's unfolding in the same complex and you start to get the understanding of <clears throat> this is what we're talking about and we're we're talking about the moment here the number of possibilities contained within a given field defined by its combined subsets Right. Okay. Yeah. I see. So the equation on the right is, you know, is, is is a simple equation to define the moment, you know, right now, right now, right now. But there are aspects of that that are not displayed here because whatever is going to happen right now, there is also a cone of probabilities, meaning right. that from an infinite field of potentials, mm-hmm. infinite field of potentials and people sometimes can't get their head around that right an infinite field of potentials now the moment is just like it's like a it's like a think of it as like a line or a pencil moving through this infinite field of potentials consider the infinite field of potentials in that sphere that you see there think of it as uh an infinite field of black and white ping pong balls okay okay as this moment is moving. The ping pong balls are not moving toward the moment. The moment is moving. Because why? In the equation here, it says that the moment is defined by the sum total of change approaching zero plus change approaching the infinite. Time approaching zero plus time approaching the infinite. It means that that change and time never reach zero meaning it's in constant motion and change and time never reach the infinite which means they never get to the edge of potential or possibility so they're moving in that way that the moment is constantly moving so the idea then is when you get into like some of the some of the theories and experiments of guys like the old jewish physicist itzhak bentov right there's a great book uh stalking the wild pendulum i know physicists who have told me i became a physicist because of this book you know wow he talks about entrainment he talks about sympathetic resonance he talks about uh, constructive and destructive waveforms etc entrainment those kinds of things Mm -hmm. so when you're in the moment as an individual standing in the moment in the moment of your life and it's the only thing you're in charge of you're not in charge of five minutes ago. You're actually not in charge of five minutes from now. You're only in charge of right now. And you're only in charge of how you're going, how you're reacting to what's occurring in the moment right now. And in the theory of this, what happens is as you in the moment process and resonate in the moment, <clears throat> you begin to entrain from this infinite field of possibilities, infinite field of potentials, things that are possibilities that are resonating in the same way you are resonating begin to entrain, meaning they theoretically begin to line up. They're called patterns of potentials now. Okay. 
<clears throat> so I see. that makes sense. <clears throat> makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. You're, it's it's much more complex than this when yeah. from a physics perspective. But in in a lay terms, you're getting the picture, right? Absolutely. So yeah. you're the moment moves, and it's not moving in a linear time in, in a linear fashion. It's not left to right. It's not going from here. It's it's moving through an infinite field. Mm. But but you're staying within a cone of probability. <clears throat> everything that you well know. a cone of probabilities begins to establish itself. And what that's saying is there's a distribution relating to time that as as the moment moves and these patterns of potentials line up, right? That as the moment gets there, that different, there could be one pattern of potentials and only slightly altered from that, a different pattern of potentials Mm. and a different pattern and a different pattern and a different pattern. And as... As the moment moves and your resonation, your resonation, your frequency is what attracts those patterns of potentials that as you go, as you move towards them, that they're shifting and jiggling, you know, figure it in this experiment, this thought experiment, they're shifting and moving, right? And the closer you're moving towards those patterns, some become less likely to become part of your reality, right. part of the moment, and others become more likely to become, right? Yep. So some of those variants start to drop off and drift off. And then as you're moving, all based on your resonance, on your your focus, your idea for this, how you're going to respond in the moment, how you are responding in the moment. And this is a really powerful understanding. And when you when people grasp it, like I can see you do. It's like it changes how you see your role in the world and how you see the world in which yeah. you are. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, big time. <clears throat> so this is a scientific explanation of things you'll hear people throw out there, like, oh well, you manifest. Ah, fuck. No, you're not manifesting it. What you're doing is you're establishing patterns of potentials. And the more you resonate, the more you are causing that sympathetic resonance or that entrainment or that constructive waveform right. with a particular potential wow, as you man. keep moving. Now, here's a big wrench in the works. There's a fucking thing called change distribution. Motherfucker. <laughs> Bastards. Fuck. Change distribution deals with the idea that there is a collective impact on your moment, a collective impact. Okay. So we don't exist in this world by ourselves, there's a collective impact. And that change distribution can alter and skew even when you least expect it or don't expect it. It can shuffle because why? Because it's a collective change distribution. It's billions of people. There is a global moment shared by all of us, right? That affects the moment that each of us experience. And how does how does what somebody's doing across the uh, in China affect what I'm doing here? Uh, it goes back to a, a whole nother uh, a whole nother uh, expression of the Is, fact that we're, we're in a. <clears throat> it's like uh, I uh, there was an old physicist that explained it in this way. Is this the newosphere? Have you heard of the newosphere? I forget. No. I forget. Somebody explained it to me on a podcast. <clears throat> it's like we're all raisins in jelly or jello. So if if the collective vibration or frequency of all the raisins in the jello is at one frequency, you as a single raisin in the jello are not going to not vibrate at that frequency. Oh shit. <clears throat> right? Wow. It's that's a good way to look at it, you know, as a, just it's a, a, a thought exp- experiment a analogy, for you. Yeah. yeah. So, and there are all kinds of other understandings. Like, it, for example, we, we live in a capacitor. Uh, so there's a negative charge on the surface of the earth, ionic charge on the mm-hmm. surface of the earth. Up 85 kilometers into the ionosphere, and that fluctuates, right? It, it can go up to three, three some, 300 kilometers, but it, it comes back down, so it's, it's misshapen, etc. And there are all kinds of things that cause that to happen, uh, solar activity, lunar activity, etc. But so the ionosphere 
expands and contracts, but the ionosphere has a positive charge to it. So a negative charge and a positive charge and in electrical uh, engineering and understanding that it forms a capacitor. A capacitor is a storage device for waveform, for, for power, for energy, okay, right? Okay. <clears throat> so in that negative and positive charge up to the ionosphere, all of the waveforms, all of the waveforms, and yet, let's just talk about the man-made waveforms. Let's just talk about, you know, radios and television and, you know, the, everything that's Wi-Fi and everything that's everything, right? All of the waveform expressions of things, GPS, satellites, this, blah, 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 right? right? <clears throat> all of that exists within that capacitor. So think for a moment how completely inundated your mind is your every cell of your body with the waveform expressions of all those things that are out there inside that capacitor and then understand that some of it can some of it escapes some of it doesn't but also the waveform expression of everything outside the capacitor is also inside your you're feeling that and you're connected to that you're swimming in a literal sea of a waveform expression of all things hence you know it's an omnipresent existence in this eight dimensional hyperspace okay so with that background so you would kind of understand <laughs> sort of and you get it i can yeah, tell yeah yeah <clears throat> what happens then is when we're talking about your ability to do three metronomic steps detect decode objectify and here's why it's not 100% accurate, because you're detecting an eight-dimensional hyperspace. In the moment that you're doing this, you are detecting. Can you go backwards to a, to a moment that was part of the collective existence that is now back? At, once it comes through that moment, once it's in and out of the moment as a collective experience, and everybody has a collective experience, See, like going back to this thing, right? Even when it strikes ice, you're looking at the experience in an event arc of time of seven people, but there were nearly 2,000 people there. Right. Every one of them have their own version of this event arc right. of time, right? right. <clears throat> so once that moves out of there, once it's out of the experience, and it's now back into the infinite field of potentials, it's in the past, we say, but it's really just into an infinite field of potentials. Can you go back to it? Yes. If you go back to it, uh, is it 100% like what it was when you experienced it? No, never. Conceptual illusion, right? Right, right. Plus, right. it's got a, a collective interpretation and reinterpretation. Mm. If it was something that affected that many people. So, it's a bizarre idea. But now, let's say I wanted to send you okay. <clears throat> as a remote viewer to 1140 a.m. on that date to see the RMS Titanic strike ice. Okay. My concept of the target is strikes ice. The, mil the moment, the very moment that steel strikes ice, all the shit leading up to it and all the shit after it, you will start to, you'll start to be able to pull that out to detect it, decode it, and objectify it. But my concept is a very pinpoint moment in time when something happened and that's what i set as the coordinates for you so if i do that and i lock that down you you actually as a program manager you write that down uh, you know target concept is rms titanic striking ice and you can elaborate it steel strikes ice at this time on this date okay okay <clears throat> if i'm thinking about the whole arc do we have to know where do we have to know <clears throat> location no. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. You, if, if, if your intention is to, I, you want to know more, right? You want to get, you want, you want to find hundred, you, you look, get a hundred different interpretations. <laughs> you want a hundred different event arcs of time. You see how Got it. rich that becomes now? Yep. Right? Yep. So when you, when you do this and you lock down that event, this is what I'm after. Then you assign two sets of, of four numbers and you have to be really good at this if you fuck this up the whole group or class or group of remote viewers if your mind wanders like you're going okay rms titanic 1040 and it's like 
I wonder if Burger King is still open right <laughs> now. You know, I'm, I think maybe ribs tonight. Or, you know, mm -hmm. if you start doing that, what will happen is now you've skewed the intention, the concept of the target, and some of them will get it, and some of them will just bounce off and go where the fuck ever. And it happens, and it's happened. I've, I've watched it happen in class where I've, like, given this responsibility to somebody who probably shouldn't have had it and or i gave it to somebody i trusted but that person had to go to the bathroom so they give it to somebody else to do who's part of my staff but that person's not ready to do it and that person you know, goes like uh rms titanic and you know yeah when i get out of here i'm gonna go get a salad and and they put the coordinates down and it's not a hard connect on a concept of the target do you follow? It's not a hard connect. Right. Okay. It needs to be a hard connect. Okay. And the harder you can connect it and the better trained you are at connecting it in that way, the better the target results will be from the remote viewers. If you skew, if you're thinking something else or you can't hold that thought when you assign those coordinates, the, the viewers will skew. There will be less quality data. But what do you mean when you say assign coordinates? We said two sets of four numbers. Right. Okay, so now they're ran they're, it used to be called random numbers. They don't have to be random. You could say, uh, you could say, you know, two zero two three. That's the first four, and then you could say uh, zero nine zero one. Now, I teach always that the last number is a one. It doesn't have to be. But I teach it that way because as a coordinate remote viewer, when you come off of that la off that one, you have to respond autonomically with what's called an ideogram. An ideogram is the first graphic representation of the target site. And it falls into a certain set of, of, of category of stuff that you're going to work on. This is, I mean, I don't want to confuse everybody about it, but it, it, you know, it's either going to be land, water, land, water interface. It's going to be mountain. It's going to be a structure or it's going to be, right? Okay. It's these, these things. So that's not what you want your audience to be thinking about. It's just that that's why there's a one there. Mm -hmm. So you could say two, zero, two, three, just so you could make sure that if for your records, you could know that this class or this group of remote viewers on 2023 did this target and 09 being September, they did it on September and the 01 doesn't matter. It, 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 that, that part, it, you're not trying to lock down the day, okay. right? The, the viewers are trained to put down the, the, the date and the time of they start and the time that they end the session and all that stuff on there anyway, right? And their name declaring personal inclemencies, declaring advanced visual stuff. I'm just telling you, that's how the coordinates work. Okay. So the detect, the code, and objectify simply defined are this. Detecting is, again, altered brainwave state, alpha brainwave state, and you have a piece of paper in front of you in coordinate remote viewing. You've taken the coordinates, responded autonomic, you've decoded the ideogram into its ABC components, don't ask. You don't want to go there. Right okay. Now. And then you're going to start into stage two. Colors, textures, temperatures, tastes, sounds, smells, demo dimensionals, okay. et cetera, right? Okay. Contours. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so your pin's going on the paper and you're closing your eyes and you're, what are the colors? Now, that is a detecting and as that waveform expression, right? omnipresent you're not projecting there it's all around you so all you're doing now is based on the address based on the address you've been given which are the two sets of four numbers and the concept of everything we're talking about here now all you're doing is prompting yourself okay what what, what colors and as colors come to you that's called detecting and decoding now the detecting is eight-dimensional hyperspace. It's done with the unconscious mind. The decoding is when, at the speed of thought, your conscious mind decodes it into four-dimensional lexicon. Time, 
height, width, depth. It decodes it into four-dimensional lexicon. So, oh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's purple, or it's blue, or it's red, or it's chartreuse, or it's, uh, it's no color, white, so, or it's, it's empty, or it's this, or, oh, it's tall, or mm-hmm. it's thick, or it's long, or <laughs> it's, it's bumpled, it's, uh, you know, whatever. The all, as you keep going through these things, you're detecting, you're decoding it into the four-dimensional lexicon, and then you objectify. The objectify objectification means you're sketching it on a piece of paper. You're putting the verbal sensory data in accordance with the structure that you're right. taught in stage okay. two or stage three or stage four or stage five or stage six, right? You're, that's what you're doing. Detect, decode, objectify. Now, why is it not 100% accurate? And why will it never be 100% accurate? And why are you never going to win the lottery as a remote? <laughs> and why should you never give somebody to invest your money who claims that they've got a hedge fund that they use remote viewing to determine, you know, where to put the money? And <clears throat> because it not, first of all, it's just bullshit. But second of all, it, it's impossible. It's a human interpretation. Right. It's a human interpretation to detect That's the purest it comes. But your brain, your conscious mind, right? It it has to assimilate it into something that means something in this four-dimensional world. So it take it calls upon its references. It calls upon your lexicon, what you've experienced, what you've done, what you've seen, what you've read, what you've heard, right? What you've touched, what you've smelled, what you've tasted, what you've felt, what you all these things. And it goes, it does it that fast, faster, fast, you know, a Roush, uh, Elizabeth uh, Rauscher and uh, <clears throat> Targ have written several papers on the speed of human thought being faster than, than the speed of light. <laughs> I fucking love it. We cognate faster than the speed of light, which is actually true. So... Uh, the speed with which we are able to detect, decode, and objective, uh, detect and decode is phenomenal, right? So it comes quick, quick, quick. And once you have it, it, and the funny thing about it is, because I keep saying it's based on your experience Rolodex or your, your experience database, you know, a more upgraded term, right? If, if, you don't, if you don't have a reference for it, if you don't have never experienced it, your conscious mind will struggle for a millisecond and then it will call upon the 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 best matching experience that it can so if you don't know what it's like if you don't know what it's like to be on the bottom of the atlantic of the north atlantic you have no idea about the darkness the pressure the mm-hmm. you have no reference for it your conscious mind will come up with a a match It'll, oh, it'll, wow. it'll come up with something close to it. Something you've experienced. Like dark. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, chilly, uh, you know, hard mm. to breathe, uh, blah, blah, blah. You'll, that's what it does. Got it. Okay. That's what viewers are constantly working with. And then by the time you take that and then objectify it on the paper, like you're trying to sketch something, some aspect of it. Mm-hmm. You're trying to sketch energetics or you're trying to sketch pressure. Right? How do you sketch pressure? Right. How how do you? Or you're just trying to write it down, mm-hmm. but you have no idea what it feels like. At, I mean, most people have no idea what it feels like at one atmosphere. You know, mm-hmm. to be thirty three feet right. and, and understand what the pressure differential is and how that feels. Or two atmospheres or three atmospheres. They have no reference for it, so they struggle with how to explain some of the things that they're experiencing. Uh, and the same goes if, you know, the target you're giving them is some high strangeness, you know, uh, right. ranch out somewhere. Right. Uh, they, <laughs> they come up with, they do the best that they can. Mm-hmm. And uh, what you're looking for is correlation mm. between multiple viewers. That's why one viewer, you, there are three rules that pertain to remote viewing. It's not 100% accurate, never has been, never will be. Anybody tells you it is, they're full of shit and lying okay <laughs> you never trust the results of one remote viewer operating independently of other remote viewers okay never okay it's never one viewer telling you what's going on in the world mm-hmm. they don't know they could be completely wrong 
or they could be completely right. What are you going to wager that they're one or the other? You right. don't know. So right. what you're looking for is correlation in data. You want as many as you can get working the same target. Now you're looking for trends and correlation and data, Got it. right? Got it. The highs and lows don't matter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and thirdly, it has never been, nor was it ever intended to be a standalone endeavor, remote viewing. It was used as just, it had to be used in consonance with other intelligence collection methodologies. So that means if you're doing it and you're going to do it in, in law enforcement work, investigative work, or medical <clears throat> diagnostic work, or something else, right? Whatever you're going to do with it, it has to be used in consonance with Right. other things, which is what made it potentially very powerful in Beyond Skinwalker, right? Because they had all of their experiments that they were doing. The problem was that the first time it was done, they had already done the experiments before the remote viewers were even doing the target. So that's one of the things that Travis said, which was like, shit, you know? We should have had this first, and then we could have gone to where they said these things happen, and we could have, we could have run the experiment there right. instead of just running the experiment here. Right, right, right. Mm. So now I think in season two, hopefully, you know, it will work it that way with them and do those kinds of things. But I mean, I'm sorry to talk fast. Oh, no, it's fascinating, man. It, it, it really is. Like there really is. Um, <coughs> Well, Mr. Morehouse, we just did like three and a half hours. I think we're going to have to come back for part two of this. I hope so, yeah. Th this was very fun. Thank you. I won't get much. lost next time. I put with the GPS. <laughs> yeah, send right. me into Tampa. To you, come should, oh, you should uh, use your remote viewing to figure out yeah. exactly where we're at. Yeah, I've tried that. I always I get even more lost whenever <laughs> I do that. Um, well, thanks again. <clears throat> tell, tell people out there where they can find you, find your work, all that stuff. Yeah, the uh, brand new website going up. Uh, it's uh, davidmorehouse.org. Dot .org. Uh, don't go to the dot .com one. I don't actually own that. And uh, I really don't have anything to do there. And don't buy any of the stuff that's on it either. DavidMorehouse.org. <laughs> and then there is a YouTube channel, which I always forget the name. Uh, I have a brand new YouTube channel. It's got, it'll, as soon as this comes out, it'll be there. Okay, perfect. Stuff. So um, yeah, I, I just look for David Morehouse, David.Morehouse or David Morehouse on YouTube, right? I'll link it all there. below so people can find it easy. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right, man. Thanks again. Yeah, it was my pleasure. All right. Goodbye, world. Woo!